One of the most amazing things about software is you can learn how to build something that can reach people around the world, whether it's only five people all the way up to billions of people. It's, it's pretty incredible that that's possible in this day and age. Now, in order for us to get to that scale, to actually reach those people and help those people, we need to start somewhere. And the way that you start is by building a web application. Now, you might be wondering, what is a web application? Well, it's simple. It's a smart website. So that means that it remembers things. It has a database. It has some security. It has sessions so you can log in. You know, it has all of those features that you might be very familiar with now, right? So if you use something like Instagram or Twitter, you're already familiar with this process. Those are built on top of web applications. So what we want to do is we want to take the basic concept of a web application and actually implement it in something real. And we're going to be doing that using Django. Django is a web application framework written in Python. Now, Python is a programming language that I would argue is very approachable for beginners. And I do recommend that you have some experience with Python prior to jumping in here. But Django, it is all in Python and it takes a lot of those concepts that build up web applications and it makes it really, really easy to build one with not that much time and also not that much of a in-depth understanding of everything that's going on. That is what attracted me to Django in the first place, right? I found it actually pretty simple to build a basic web application. And then from there, I started asking these questions like, how do I actually change what I store in the database? Right? Like that's simple, but it's a good question. And once you start uncovering these questions, you will start to want to dive deeper into Django itself and also building web applications and all that. And I want to be here for that journey for you. So let me know if you have any questions. In this series, we're going to be taking you through Django step by step to make sure that you know how to launch your own web application. And you're going to do it in hopefully less time than you've ever thought possible. Again, let me know if you have any questions. My name is Justin. I'm going to be taking you through this series and I want to make sure that you really understand Django, which is why I've been launching these courses for years. And I will say, if you find a different version of Django and a course with that different version, go ahead and stick with that version. This is meant to be an update to the latest version, but the idea here is you shouldn't be too worried about the version of Django. Instead, what you should be worried about is the Django itself, like actually learning what's inside of Django. That's also true with Python too. There are certainly changes that happen and some of them are important, but for the most part, as you're learning, those changes don't really matter. Instead, you wanna understand the concepts that build up web applications and how you actually do that with Django in a real, actual live environment. Let's go ahead and get started. Here's an overview of what we're going to be building. It is a modern blog application. So you can look at the blogs, the URLs change, our content changes, we have published times. Um, but another thing that we have is the ability to simply edit things, edit the time they are going to be published, and also upload images. And all of this can be, in addition, managed in the Django admin. The Django admin is very powerful and it's very useful for us to make changes too, right? So there's a lot of things in here that aren't showing up on our main page. Another thing we can do is actually a search, something like working, and we get some results here. We see that search result and even better, we monitor those lookups, right? We actually look for and save those queries. So this stuff might not seem all that complicated because it's not. Creating a blog is very straightforward to do. But to get here, it does take some time. So what we discuss is how to create views for CRUD. So we show you how to list everything out, how to show only published items, how to show all kinds of items if it's a user that's logged in. So yes, we talk about users and authenticating users. 
we show you how to upload images and files um, and associate those to any given user. We also show you how to use regular forms in Django and model forms in Django. Both are very useful concepts to either just have some basic data come through or a lot of data and data that you might want to store on the database and data that you might not. Really depends to you. We're also going to talk about URLs and URL routing. That means that how every piece of this blog is rendered out, right? So like here, this is a list. This has a bunch of items in them, right? That even shows us the draft items. That's pretty cool. And then we also have a way to look at the detail items. We can edit things and we can also delete things. Now, if you're not familiar, these concepts are the same regardless of what application you're building. If you think about it, let's say, for instance, you're building an e-commerce site. You have to list out all your products. You want to see a detail of that product. And then you, as the admin, might want to be able to edit or delete those products. Now, let's think about that on like Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. Same thing. You have a list of posts. You want to see a detail of a post. You can edit or delete those posts as well. So those concepts are discussed in detail and it shows you in code as well using the function based views. The reason we use this method is because it's an easy method to get introduced to. And it's an easy way to really understand how each one of these web pages works behind the scenes. And naturally, we're also going to talk about HTML templates and how these template variables work. So all of this stuff really just makes Django flourish as an amazing web application and to make amazing web applications on your own. So, so much of this is about conceptual as well as practical implementation of the Django project. Now, when we look at this project, it does look pretty simple, right? It, yeah, sure, it's responsive and all that, and thanks to Bootstrap, uh, but it doesn't seem like there's that much going on. And certainly there isn't that much going on, but it's definitely the foundation for everything else that you could build with Django. One more thing before we actually jump in is that we have all of our code open sourced, and that's all on github.com slash coding for entrepreneurs. This open source code means that Anytime in this series, you can jump into the code, look at what we actually did in the repo itself. So you can see, let's say for instance, you needed to reference the blog model. You go into this blog models and you can see all of the code as it exists, at least at the very end, if not in every lecture itself. So this is really important to help you through this process because you might miss a comma somewhere. You might miss a parenthesis somewhere. And when that happens, it can be really frustrating. So I've open sourced all of the code to help alleviate a lot of that problem. Another thing is you can absolutely learn from some of these other projects, even if you don't go through the series themselves. Like if you look at the e-commerce project, you can actually kind of diagnose what's going on with it after you take this series and really just build your own e-commerce just with the knowledge that you have here. Now, of course, if you want more context and you want to know exactly how it's going on, just go ahead and check out that course altogether. But the idea here is that we have everything open sourced and we walk through this entire series with you step by step and we make sure that you get it right the first time or after a few iterations. So let me know if you have any questions. Otherwise, let's go ahead and jump in. So if you're on Mac or Linux, go ahead and open up your terminal window. And if you're on Windows, make sure you're using PowerShell. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to CD into my dev folder. Now, I created this dev folder to store all of my code projects. And as you see, I already have a folder called Try Django. So go ahead and do make dir Try Django if you don't have that. We're going to CD into Try Django. And now we're going to make our virtual environment. So pip env dash dash python 3.6 install django equals equals to 2.2. You can absolutely use python 3.7 or above, but certainly nothing below that. I'm going to go ahead and hit enter. And you're like, well, wait, wait, wait. I don't, I've never done any of these things before. If you haven't done this stuff, I'll tell you about some resources at the end of this video um, on exactly how you can go about getting to this point, right? 
But the main thing is we're starting a virtual environment and we're gonna download Django. That stuff's not really that complicated and I'm using pip EMV because it's very easy to do it cross-platform. That is Windows, Linux, and Mac. Now that we've got that, let's go ahead and do pip EMV shell. And inside of the shell, I already have some files listed out, but all you should see is pip file and pip file lock. I'm gonna go ahead and make a directory called SRC, which is where I'm going to store my Django project. And we're gonna do Django-admin start project. And this one is gonna be called try Django. And then I'll just have that period at the end there to make it inside of this SRC folder. I hit enter list everything out looks like it's it's uh it's actually correct so let's go ahead and run the server all right i haven't done my migrations yet i'll do that in a second uh, but let's go ahead and open up this in our browser and there we go we have django 2.2 installed started and we're ready to start working but one more setup process that i'm going to do is actually add this into a project into Sublime, into my text editor. Now notice I've already actually done it, but I'll go ahead and do it again, just to show you guys how it's done, okay? If you haven't done this a 100 times already, then yeah, this will be review for a lot of you. Okay, so we navigate to our dev folder, um, you know, where we just used that Tri Django project, we did the virtual environment, I open this up, and I'm gonna save this project as, and of course it's the Tri Django project that I already have saved in there, but I'm gonna go ahead and do it again. I'll replace what I have. You probably won't see that. But there we go. We now have our project going, and I might as well run my migrations just to really solidify it. So Python manage.py, migrate, and then we'll go ahead and do Python manage.py, create super user. And I'm going to use CFE as my username and then a whatever password because I'm working locally. Now, if you haven't seen any of what I just did before, that means that you really need to go and check out our GitHub repo. So this repo right here is where we have this readme. This will give you the getting started guide uh, because we've set up our system already. Um, and this guide will actually show you how to set up your system and do everything that we just did. Now, this guide is made for beginners. So if everything that I just did was like so fast and over your head, then check out some of these other courses because they definitely introduce some concepts a lot slower than what I just did. Now, 30 Days of Python will give you a lot more of a foundation of Python. So you can actually build projects with Python. And then you are certainly going to want to know HTML and CSS. So checking out the getting started with HTML and CSS project is a good idea. That's just a generally a good idea. Now, you don't need to know HTML and CSS like, like the back of your hand to, to be successful in this series or with Django even but it's a really, really good idea to have at least some of the fundamental basics down. And then finally, we are gonna be covering Bootstrap, so doing the Bootstrap basics and understanding how Bootstrap works is certainly recommended as well. Um, those things, if you haven't done them before, the reason I'm talking about them now is because I do think that they are important enough to really be successful with Django and also with this series. Now, even though the actual setup process felt very rapid fire like, I wanna make sure that you know that's only to help guide the beginners. Like the absolute beginners that have never done that before probably shouldn't be doing this whole series from scratch, right? They should be getting more familiarity with some of the absolute basics. That's the reason for that. Now, going forward, we will be discussing all sorts of Django stuff in depth. And it's probably going to be more at this pace versus what I started with. Okay, so now that we have that project set up, let's go ahead and go back into it. So CD into my dev folder, into try Django. And let's go ahead and activate our virtual environment, pipmv shell. Now I did mention it, but pipmv makes it easy for me to send this code to a Windows, Linux, or Mac user. And you could just run pipmv shell or and also pipmv 
install, and then all of your requirements will be there, your virtual environment will be created and so on. Cool. So now we gotta ask the question is like, what is Django for, right? So if I CD into the SRC folder and run Django, so Python manage.py run server, I'm gonna go ahead and grab that URL and let's go ahead and take a look at it. So in here, we have our Django project running. It is Django 2.2, pretty sweet, the newest version. And this is where we start to discuss what Django is for. Now, if we go into the admin, this is something that's built into Django, right? So Django has a way for your database and Django to talk to each other very easily. Now, if you've ever done like a one-click install to WordPress, this is in a way like the WordPress admin. It's not quite the same because that's just a whole different kind of system. But the idea here is that you can change database entries really easily using Django. So let's go ahead and log in. This is that super user password that I created. Now, if you don't remember what it is or you don't have one, you could go ahead and just create a brand new one. So Python manage.py, create super user and do it that way. That super user has access to log in to the Django admin. Of course, we have to make sure our server is running or our development server is running to get in, and then we log in. So right out of the gates, Django has user authentication and authorization. It's built in to Django. I mean, this saves a lot of development time in of itself, right? I just actually logged into Django. Now I can test this by going into an incognito window and it's gonna make me log in again, right? So my session is no longer valid. Now, of course, all sorts of things I can do in here. I can look at these users, I can make changes to them and those changes should stay regardless of if I'm logged in or not, right? So if I log out, Actually, let's log out and also destroy the server or, or cancel out on the server with control C. We can rerun the server. Now control C, it says it right there. That's usually how you cancel a lot of commands on the command line anyway. All right, so I've got the server running again and I log in again and what do you know? It still has my user as well as that name that I set. So it has this persistent storage and that storage is inside of this db.sqlite3 file, right? So that's my actual database file right now. So hopefully this tells you a lot of what Django does out of the gates. It has authentication, which means it has security. Um, it also stores it, the passwords in a secure manner. Like it's not just the raw password like we have with our username and uh, our first name. Those are just raw data, right? So it does that. Um, it also maps to database technologies. So it easily maps to SQL. And that's called the Django ORM. I'm not gonna get into that too much here, but the idea is that what you define in Django can be mapped into a database so we can access that database. Now, if you're not aware, databases have a syntax and language of their own. So there's something called SQL, that's SQL, queries that you can run on your database. Django does and handles all of that stuff for you. So those are some of the built-in things about it. The other thing is, as you notice, I'm changing the pages. Django's also handling that. It's handling what should be seen in any given page. In this case, it's using the Django admin, but what we're gonna be building is not in the Django admin. I mean, we start here because it's built in, but we use a lot of the features that build up the Django admin to build our own web application, right? To, to have this sort of interaction with our actual users because the Django admin is not gonna have that. So another thing that's built into Django is something called views and views handles how any of these pages are rendered. Now, what that means is, is it actually converts a bunch of data into an HTML document and it shows that document at any given URL. If you're unclear of what I'm talking about, no worries there. We're gonna absolutely go over every step of all of that to make it our own, right? But I just wanted to give you 
an idea of what it is that Django does and why we use Django versus something like WordPress. You use Django because you have complete control over every piece of this. WordPress, you probably could change all those things, but it's not made that way. WordPress is made to work out of the box for blogs. Django can make a blog, it can do all sorts of things, and it could also make a web application like Instagram. I mean, Instagram used it, I think they still use it, but it's their main backend, right? That's, that's pretty cool to know. So Django has a lot of power built into it by default, and those are the things we're gonna go over. Now we're gonna go ahead and set up our homepage. It's also known as our index page or even potentially even called your site's root, which basically means that it's where your domain is gonna end up and that's the homepage. Hopefully you're already familiar with that concept, but let's go ahead and create our own. Now the reason we're seeing this is because we haven't really changed anything about Django. Once you change something about Django, this will be gone and it will show error pages instead, assuming there are errors. So let's go ahead into Sublime Text and I'm gonna go ahead and create my first view. So to create views, we are gonna create a new file. This is gonna be a Python file and I'm gonna put it into where settings.py is and I'm gonna call this views.py, okay? So what Django is called, it's a model view template setup. So that's MVT. You may have heard of MVC, model view controller. Django's more of a model view template. No worries if you don't know what that means, um, but just get the idea that whenever we want to change what a page looks like, we start with a view. We don't start with HTML. We start with just a view. It's a function, it's a Python function or a Python class that can actually render out some stuff. So let's go ahead and see that. I'll do from django.http import HTTP response. And then we'll define home page and we're gonna return an HTTP response. So at its core, this is what any given view function does. It is declared as a function, a Python function, and then it returns a response of some kind. Now, initially, I'm just gonna go ahead and return a string, which is valid HTML, which is just h1, hello world, h1. Right, so this is not a valid HTML document per se, but the string itself is HTML string, right? So we've got an h1 tag and we close it off with an h1 tag, okay? So another default that comes in with this view is called a request, right? So when you go to any page, like any page on the internet, that's called a request. You're requesting that page to come to your computer and therefore our view gets that request and then it returns a response, right? That's a very common thing. You request something and you get something in return. That's how the internet works. Now you probably know this on a intuitive level um, but that's the technical level. You get a request, it returns a response. Cool. So now we've defined this view. What do I have to do? Now what I need to do is have a way to actually access this function. Like how do I actually run this function on Django, like on my page? Well, to do that, we have to talk about the concept of URLs. Now you might already be familiar with this, but what a URL is, of course, in your browser, it's what that that's an actual URL right there. And then if you change it to like slash ABC and then even slash CFE or just CFE, yeah, like you keep changing these things, um, those are actually new URLs. Now, I, I think that you probably already know this, but if you don't, um, what the idea here is that this path or this address goes somewhere that your web application will start to understand. Your web application breaks whatever that URL is that anyone requests, and then it returns something, some sort of response based off of what they request. So what that means is then we need to go into our urls.py. So in here, this is where we configure any given URL to map up to any given view function. And at its core, you will always do this in Django. You will always have some sort of URL that maps to some sort of function. 
And you have a lot of flexibility of what that means. So let's do the first thing and that is actually changing our admin URL. And it's really simple. I'm just gonna go ahead and do CFE dash admin. You can do whatever you want here. Inside of this path method, we're just gonna call CFE admin and leave everything else the same. So with my Django project still running, right? So my server's still going there. I have no issues. I'm gonna go into the admin again, right? I'm at admin right now. I refresh. Now it's giving me a page not found error, right? That's because I moved the URL. No surprises here, right? So really simple. I moved the URL to CFE-admin and it changes immediately. So that's Django understanding what the person is requesting to be able to actually make that sort of change. I'm gonna leave it as admin because that's actually a better place to have it. And I'm gonna go ahead and finally bring in that view that we created to actually be rendered inside of our project. So whenever I wanna use a view, I'm gonna go ahead and import it into my URLs. So in this case, I can use a relative import and we're gonna import the actual view function itself, which we called homepage, right? So the relative import, meaning dot views, URLs and dot views are inside of the same module. So you can do, you know, this dot views call. And then we import that actual function itself. And now we're gonna go ahead and make our first pattern. I'm just gonna literally copy what's already there. Now you have a few examples up here. You can go off of those if you'd like, or we can just do that. So it's an empty string here. And then we just put this homepage. Cool. So we've now actually created our first URL and then we mapped it to that first view that we created. So now if we go to that URL or our homepage, you should see this. Awesome. If you don't see this or if this is confusing at all, of course, let us know in the comments. Otherwise, let's keep going. Now that we understand how we can create these URLs, let's go ahead and make a few more. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and say about and then contact or content, contact, either one, okay? So this path, this is the path to that URL, right? So if I go into slash about now, it renders out the same thing. If I go into contact, it also renders out the same thing. If I go to ABC, we get a page not found. No surprises here. Now the about and contact pages probably shouldn't be the same as the home page, right? They should probably show us some sort of different information. So this means then we would jump into our view and actually copy the views and make it a couple more times. And instead of all be called home page or anything like that, we would do about and contact. And then we can say about us and we can say contact us. And then we can go back into our, our, our URLs where we want to import these views. I'm gonna use parentheses now to import multiple. And then we'll say about page, contact page. Okay. So with that, we grab this about page, we grab this contact page, and there we go. Now, if I refresh in here, of course, I saved everything. I do get in the habit of just saving by default and a quick way to do it is Command S or Control S if you're on Windows. There we go. Contact us and about, about us. Great. That's pretty cool. Very easy to do, right? One other really cool aspect of this, especially if you're coming from the HTML world, is you're not having to type .html for each page that's rendered. Now, if you don't know what that is, that's okay. But the nice thing about how Django is set up is our URL paths are nice and clean. And again, Django knows about these things. Django is the one that's handling how these URL paths are running. You don't need any other technology to do it. Django URLs do it. Now's a good time to talk about the path method here. Now this path method is part of Django 2.0 and above. It's just a string. There's not really any complicated things going on here. But what you could actually do is something called a re path, 
or if you're on an older version or you're used to an older version of Django, it was the URL itself. So repath means regular expression. And it's gonna look just like this, right? So it's not a whole lot different, but it is different, right? It actually works differently. Um, so repath is called a regular expression. Regular expressions are very commonly used in Python. And the reason that Django had regular expressions for a really long time is not for something as simple as this, but more for something like this. So let's go ahead and just do a very simple example of a regular expression. And I'll just say page is pages. And if I put that question mark there, it's basically gonna say, well, let's take a look. If I now go to that URL and type out pages, oh, let's make sure we save that. I get pages rendered. Of course, it's showing me about us. What if I get rid of that S? Ah, right. So this actually works on two levels. It works with, it renders out to something like this. So I'll just show you about page. So it renders that, but it also renders the S, right? So this one line renders two different pages. Now, regular expressions can get a lot more complicated than this, and we will talk about them in more detail soon, but that's what's going on. I'm bringing this up for those of you who might use older versions of Django, and you might see other tutorials that in most cases are really valid still, except the only difference with the URLs is path, RE path, instead of just URL. All right. As you might imagine, returning an HTTP response like this is fine for a toy example like we've done, but in the long run, we want to actually render out a real HTML document. It has to be real valid HTML to really make this thing useful. So what we can do is actually set up our templates directory. So inside of my SRC folder, I'm going to make a new folder called templates, All right? So templates meaning that I can actually put actual HTML in here. So let's go ahead and make our first one. I'm just going to call this hello underscore world dot HTML. And in here, I'll just do an H1 tag and call it hello world. So, with that, I actually want my homepage to render out that hello world from the template itself, so from that HTML document itself. Now to do this, we import a, another item from Django. So from Django.shortcuts, import render. And what render is gonna do is it's gonna be something very similar to this response, but instead what it's gonna do is take in the request and then the actual template name. In my case, it's hello world.html. That's the name of this template. And then it's gonna return it. So in a similar fashion to that return response, it's gonna take in the request and combine it with the HTML document and then return things back. I'll explain what I mean by that in a little bit. So now let's go back into that homepage. Since I've changed that template, I get this error, template does not exist. Well, the reason for this is because we haven't actually set up Django to look for this folder here. So let's go ahead and do that. So this right here would actually be a server error, right? This is in debug mode right now. That's why we see it look like this, but this is an actual server error. So if I didn't set up my Django project or I named the template wrong, like if I wrote it wrong here and it had a different name here, let's say for instance, I wrote just hello.html, that's the same error. It won't be able to find this page, right? Even if I have it set up correctly. Cool. So let's set it up and simulate that error all over again so we know what the template does not exist error means. So if we go into our settings now, so in try Django, settings right next to URLs and views. We're gonna scroll down, we're gonna skip a lot of things, and we're gonna look for the templates item here. 
So this is that templates configuration. So the directory or the path as to where these templates are is ospath.join baster and then templates. You're like, whoa, 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 where did all this come from? Well, let's actually take a look. First of all, baster is or declared right here, right? So that's showing me where the root of the Django project is. That's in manage.py, right? And how I knew it was just templates because that's the name of my folder that's literally right next to manage.py. So to actually look at this, we are gonna jump into the Python shell. So I'm gonna close out the Django server and run Python manage.py shell. And we'll go ahead and do from django.conf import settings. What this does is gives me access to this settings file here. And now I can do settings.base underscore dir. I hit enter. That actually shows me the path to the root of my Django project, to that base directory. That of course is where manage.py is. And if you want to bring them together, you can do something like this. So let's go ahead and also import OS and then copy and paste this in. And of course I don't have baster defined. It's right here. So I'll go ahead and say baster is equal to that setting. And I'll go ahead and paste that value again. And there's that path. Of course, I could also just check to make sure that that's a valid path by opening up a new terminal window, copying that entire thing without the parentheses, they don't, or the uh, quotes, so you don't need them. Um, so we CD into that and we list things out. And what do you know? That's where hello world.html is. Now, the biggest difference is the reason I don't put that direct path like that is you Windows users probably already know is because. This is not the correct path on Windows, right? So you'd use different slashes altogether. Um, so this just means that it's relative to this project and it's based off of the operating system that I'm in. Those two things in, in combination with each other are how you'll actually find those templates. Cool. So now that we have that setting and we've verified some stuff, let's exit out of the Python shell and we'll run Python manage.py run server again, and then we'll go ahead and take a look at my template. And what do you know, it actually renders it out. I don't have an error. And of course, if I go back into that view and changed it to hello underscore and refresh it again, I get an error, right? It doesn't find that template because that actual template file is not inside of my templates right there, right? So of course I need that actual file. Cool. Now that I have this template, let's go ahead and bring in Bootstrap. So I'm gonna to go to getbootstrap.com. I'm gonna go into the documentation and I'm gonna scroll down to their starter template. And I'll just go ahead and copy this whole thing here and we'll paste it into our hello world. And we save that. Let's go ahead and make sure our server is still running and refreshing our homepage. Hello world looks the same. Now to make it actually look different, Let's go ahead and do div class equals to container, div class equals to row, and finally div class equals to column six MX auto. Okay, close off these divs. No worries if you don't know bootstrap enough to know what's going on, just copy what I'm doing. We'll explain some resources for that later if I haven't already. So I refresh in this page and what do you know? Hello world's there. So as you see, I have a lot more code going on. It's not a whole lot different, it's still rendering out just hello world, but there's a lot more references and this is now a valid HTML document that's being rendered. So the next question should be is like, how do I dynamically add stuff into this HTML document? In other words, how do I say change this to being a different title based off of the page that I'm on, right? So like my about page, it should be a different title. My contact page should be a different title, just like we did when we were running those examples. Let's go ahead and do that. So let's go ahead and jump into the Python shell to discuss something that you probably know, and that is string substitution. So if I said something like ABC equals to 
this is awesome. And then I wanted to actually substitute awesome with a different item. We can use, you know, the format method. So dot format and then say awesome. And we would go into ABC. You could also do it where it's a variable name. So we would say another, and then the format would be another equals to awesome, right? So this string substitution, this same concept works with Django templates. So let's go ahead and exit out of the shell and I'm gonna run the server again. So now what I can do is pass in a dictionary here with some context. So let's say for instance, I wanna pass in the context variable of title. So I'm gonna say title equals to hello there, dot, dot, dot. Okay, so I wanna pass this in and I want my HTML document to use it. Now with that string substitution, we could just say doc equals to, you know, h1 and then title h1 and then dot format title equals to title right and then that document would actually render out the correct html so django templates or the django templating engine is not a whole lot different than that but the syntax is slightly different so django rendered doc equals to almost the same thing but instead of one curly bracket you use two curly brackets. And in fact, you use that inside of the template itself. So then all we do is pass in the title being the title. Of course, we wanna have a valid dictionary here. So this is actually what's being passed. And these are arbitrary, just like they are with the string substitution in Python, right? So arbitrary variables here. So my title just so we don't get anything too confused here. I'm gonna go ahead and delete these or I'll just comment them out as reference. So again, remember those double curly brackets. Now what we wanna do is jump into our HTML document and replace this part right here with title. We save that, refresh in here. We get titles not defined. Oh, it's possible that I made a mistake. So let's go ahead and save in here. We need to make sure that everything is defined and saved. I refresh, I'm getting a doc error. Yeah, oh, it's trying to format these comments. Not exactly sure why, but let's go ahead and do that. Okay, so I got rid of those comments and now I refresh, or I, I updated those comments rather, and now I refresh and what do you know? Hey, hello there is working. Cool, so that means that also my about and contact page can do something very similar. So let's do that. And this time I'm just gonna go ahead and pass the title here about us and also pass it down here, contact us. Okay, so now what I've done is rendered context inside of a Django template. That's what it's called. So if we go to about, it says about us still, or if I change it just to about, you know, about. And of course it's actually using the same HTML. So if I inspect that element there, I see that all that HTML is exactly the same on Hello World. Now I think that's pretty cool. It makes it really easy to render out some of our own content inside of this template itself in a way that I think is also pretty familiar for a lot of you who know Python. There's this concept in web development and software development called don't repeat yourself. And it stands for, you know, dry. You'll see that over and over again when you start to build things. Now, what we wanna do is make sure that we're not being too repetitive with a lot of our content. And further, like my content right now, well, perhaps I want more than just a title in any given page, right? So perhaps I want an actual template for my about page. So to do that, I would come in here and say about.html, and then I would copy literally all of that document, and then I would put in some more relative, you know, this is about us sort of text, right? 
So now my about page has some more content and it's different content than my home page or my index page, right? But I violated dry. Right? So back into that view, I just violated that statement. How did I do that? Well, if we look in hello world, we see that I've got all of this stuff here, including the title, including the head. I've got a lot of things in here that are repetitive, not just on hello world, but also on about. So we wanna get rid of that repetitiveness. Luckily, Django has something built in for this inside of templates. So we go back into our templates, we're gonna make another new file and we're gonna call this base.html. Now this is convention, calling it base.html is convention. So that means that you can call it whatever you'd like, but most people call it base.html. And what this is, is like the parent of all of my HTML documents. What that means is I'm gonna go ahead and copy home hello world.html and paste it in here. All right, so when I say the parent, what I mean is I wanna have all of the valid HTML stuff on all of my templates. Every single template, I wanna make sure that it has those things. Right, and I also probably want to make sure it has my actual title and perhaps some brand and maybe a nav bar and stuff like that. Like I want to keep things consistent across my project and having my base.html will allow that to happen. So what I can actually do is I can go into any Django HTML document and I can delete everything and just literally say extends base.html. Right, so you got curly brackets, percent sign, extends, extends is crucial, and then quote based on HTML. Now based on HTML again is an arbitrary name, but it is convention. So if I save this on about as well as hello world, I can now render out something in this base document. So let's go ahead and look at it. I render out about, it's still rendering that context variable uh, except my other part went away and then hello world or hello there. Both of those things are still working. Great. But my paragraph went away. So that paragraph of like, this is more about stuff went away, right? So in my about, if I add that in, what the heck? It's not rendering. And that's because we don't have a way to then render it inside of this template. Right, so it's rendering out those context variables, as in the curly bracket one that are that are declared in the view, but also declared inside of that template, right? So what I need to do is add another block, which is not too dissimilar to this. That other block is called a block, right? So we open the block and we end the block. So I'm gonna replace this block, I'm gonna re replace this value with some other value. Now, as you might imagine, if I need to replace multiple values, well, how am I gonna do that when I write block the same name over and over? Like, how do I reference this block versus this block? Well, I actually just give it a name. So these are also arbitrary, but convention. Sometimes you see title, sometimes you see head title. Okay, so the blocks themselves, still curly brackets, percent. So the block and then the name. So what these blocks do is allow me to replace values inside of it. You can have them empty or actually have some sort of value, right? So I save that. And if I refresh on about, it says replace this value. And it also says it on the title up there. So back into my about.html, I can replace those values using that block again, and then the content itself. And then we called one block content and the other one we called head title. So block content, whenever you open it, you must close it. And I think the reason for the opening and closing is rather intuitive, right? So I wanna make sure that I'm replacing whatever that block is with what's inside of it. So I definitely need it opened and closed for that reason. And now I can say just about us and I refresh. What do you know? This changes and so does this. 
So this is called template inheritance. This is the main parent document, and then every replacement is being done by the child element, right? So it, it looks for that main document, and then it looks for individual blocks in there that can actually render out and change. And not to worry, you can still use those context variables and you can use them as many times as you need, right? So those are still coming in. Um, you just need to make sure that whenever you need to replace content, you put it inside of one of these blocks. Now, these blocks can render out to any kind of content. So if you had JavaScript and you wanted to put that in a block, you totally can. It just replaces what's on that HTML document. And it all does that because of this function. So this function is handling all of that for us, right? If I tried to do this same thing with HTTP response, it would not work. So it, it handles all this and it allows for much more dynamic templates. Now, if, if this isn't fully sticking yet, try it a bunch yourself. We're gonna do a lot more with these things. These are fundamental to a Django project is, is having these templates working. Before we move on from this concept, I wanna say that you don't only have to render out HTML. You can render out other kinds of things for this template engine. So let's go ahead and take a look at what I mean by that. And I'm still gonna render out HTML, but you can try it with a different data type, like a TXT or something like that. So I'm gonna just change this contact page to example page. And what I wanna do here is return the HTTP response, and I wanna return the render data. Okay, so I wanna return something here. And that's gonna be a string. So that something here is gonna be equal to the result of a template. So in our case, we'll stick with hello world and also some context. So the context or the things that will be rendered, I'll leave in as what we've been using. And this time I'll just say example. Okay. So I wanna turn this something here into actual rendered template and return it as a response. We'll get rid of some of these comments here and let's go ahead and import this example page into our URLs. Okay, and then I will put this down above the contact page and we'll just call it example. Okay, and let's go ahead and look. If we go into example, it renders out the string of hello world. No surprise here, right? because we didn't actually do anything other than set it as a string. So how do I actually turn this into a template? Well, let's go ahead and change something here to template name and the context. These are now better suited for long-term development because these are convention. And what I'll also do is go from Django.template.loader we're gonna import the get template method. This get template method then is gonna go ahead and say template object is equal to get template. And that's gonna be of this template name. So whatever that is. And then our HTTP response is going to be template object dot render. And then that context that we had here we save that, we refresh in here, and what do you know? It actually allows me to send this data in as I need. That is pretty cool. So this is roughly doing the same thing as this, but it's not quite there. Now, I just wanted to show you this because it's a good idea because every once in a while you might have a TXT or a string of some kind that you want rendered. So I'll go ahead and do the last thing of rendered item and this is not necessarily going to be convention here, neither is template object, but the idea here now is this is actually a rendered string. So I can take this same concept and use it inside of any of my pages. Let's go ahead and say that this is my title.txt and we come in here and say title and that's it, right? So it's not super complicated here, but now what I can do is leave my title in, 
say context equals to this dictionary here. And I'm going to go ahead and still pass that title as something different. This is very redundant, but I wanted to show you the example. Um, so the template name this time is now title.txt. So we can grab that, the rendered item or the rendered string in this case is going to render out hopefully something that we want to see. So we bring this down here and turn it into rendered string. And let's go back into our home page, and it's still saying hello there. And I can print out that rendered string as well. So we refresh and look at our terminal, and there it is. It's printed out inside of our terminal. Okay. So naturally, this is a lot of redundant information, but if my title.txt had you know some other data here, that we really needed to render out, you could do that there as well. So yeah, I don't think what I just showed you is super practical, this part at least, but understanding how we can render templates in other contexts that is absolutely, absolutely practical. One other aspect about the Django templating engine that's really nice, and it's not necessarily how things are being rendered, but what can be rendered. So I'm gonna simplify this homepage again and literally just use this context here. I don't need any of that old stuff, so I'll just leave it like this. And let's go ahead and take a look at it. Got my server running and I refresh in here. Um, of course, it's not actually showing anything, so let's make some modifications. I'm not gonna use hello world anymore. Now I'm gonna go ahead and use home.html. So let's make a new file for that, home.html. The process, of course, is these curly brackets with percent and extends base.html. And then we add in a block content. So block content. And that of course is because our base.html has it. And then we do in block. Okay. Uh, so again, we can have our title come in. Another thing that I can add is our user. So I can literally put user here. And I can also do user dot is authenticated. And before I check that, of course, I'm going to save everything. I can go my view and see that I did not pass that in as my context, right? It's just coming through. So that means that here I can refresh. And what do you know, it shows me my username and true. And of course, if you weren't actually log in, like I'm not in my incognito, it shows me anonymous user and false, right? Pretty cool. So this is because of Django's context variables. You can look at them inside of our settings. Um, and those context variables are coming from the context processors. It's coming from these things right here. All right, so one of them is the auth. Another thing by default that comes through is the request. So in my template again, I can also do, well, I can use request.user, which will give me the same value as that. And I can also use request.path and we can refresh and what do you know it's showing me that same information that's related to this that's pretty cool so those are django context processors they're they're added by default so on our views we don't have to re-reference them um, and this is something that's like used over and over again so that we can stay nice and dry and not have to add in our user into context every single time Right, that's pretty cool, as well as our request. So we've talked about the very basic template tags. This is a template tag, this is a template tag, this is a template tag. We can do other kinds of template tags if we want, right? So there's a condition, so if user.is authenticated, and then we can actually execute code in there. So if the user is authenticated, then we can say, you know, user only data or specific data for that user, which we'll get into later. But for now, user only data is pretty nice because that means that if I go to my incognito window, I only see this. Rather, if I go to my user that's logged in, I see all that. And of course, they're logged in through the admin if you're not clear on that one. 
So another thing we can do is loop through things. So in this home page, I'm going to add a list and I'll just call it my list. And this list will just be very simple. It's just going to be one, two, three, four, five. This is now a context variable. So inside of home.html, I can loop through that context variable again using the block. In this case, it's four and then some arbitrary variable here. So for a in my list and then whatever you open, you must close. And then in this case, I can just do a list element and literally render out the variable a. All right, so this loops through all that stuff and it's only gonna loop through if the user is authenticated, All right? So here it is and here it's not, All right? Okay, cool. So that's a few of the built-in template tags and filters. Uh, there's a lot more, right? I'm not gonna go through all of them. There's a lot on the Django docs that you can kind of play around with yourself. Um, I did the if statement, I did the for loop. Now I will say that every once in a while, you're gonna wanna have something like this in your templates. But most of the time, you're gonna wanna do that conditional logic in here. In other words, I would say something like if request.user.is authenticated, then this is what the context will be. Otherwise, the context will just be this. Right, so uh, this is where you're gonna wanna put that kind of logic. And then that way in here, it will only run this loop, right? So I get rid of all this. It's only gonna run this loop if there's values to it, right? So coming back in here and refresh, there's that stuff coming through. Whereas on my incognito window, it's not there, right? The title did change because I changed that context, but um, it's not gonna loop through if there's no value. And therefore in your actual views, this is where you're gonna to wanna to handle that sort of logic, right? So whether it's a list or any other sorts of elements, you're gonna to wanna to think of it in here. But this comes with time. Like after you practice it a good amount, then you'll start to get a better understanding of when to use what. So my argument would be use what works, get it working, and then start to refine how it's actually working. But it also helps by going through the Django documentation for these built-in template variables and actually playing around with them yourself. Right now our site is static. The reason it's static is because we declare everything and it's not really being updated or changed by anyone, right? Even the admin has nothing to do with what's currently going on on our different views as well as our URLs. Now, this is fine if that's all you really want, but Django really shines when we start making it dynamic. That is having data stored in a database that we add to and we can actually see. So there's like that interchange of data, right? So like think of like Instagram, for example, when you post something, you're adding to the Instagram's database. Django does that really, really well, which is why Instagram uses it, right? Like, or has used it in the past. Um, so if we jump into our settings file, right? So scrolling down a little bit to installed apps, these are the things that make Django that much more dynamic. And there's a lot of things built in by default, right? We've already seen the Django admin. We've seen our auth user. So our actual user that's logged in, right? So this user, right? We've seen sessions too. Sessions are, if I open up another tab, I still see that user in there, right? And we can also log out that user with sessions. There's a few other ones that I'm not gonna cover right now, but the idea here is that Django has a lot of this stuff built in and they work out of the box. But what if we wanted to add our own thing? And that's what we need to do now. But I will say that they're called apps, but I like to think of them as components, right? Say these are all little pieces that build up to the Django project as a whole. Right? Don't think of them in terms of apps like your mobile apps or the fact that this entire project could be called a web app. Like, Don't think of it in those terms. Think of them as little tiny components that build up your larger project. Right? I think that's a better term than apps because of just what convention for apps is now. Everyone thinks of apps in terms of 
your mobile phone. But in, in, when it comes to Django, the apps are the components. And these components or these apps integrate and can integrate into our database. And that's what we need to do. So let's go into our terminal and we're going to close out the server here and we'll list everything out. And I'm just going to run python manage.py and hit enter. And what we see here is there's a bunch of Django related things. Um, you know, we've seen migrate, we've seen start project. Now there's the one that we're going to use, which is start app. That's really useful if you forget what things are. So python manage.py, start app, and I'm going to call this blog. We're building a blogging application. So I'm going to call this app blog, and I want to keep it very, very narrow in focus, right? So really, it would probably be better to call it blog posts because it's related to all of my blog posts. But I'm going to keep it as blog because writing out blog underscore posts over and over again just gets very tedious. So let's keep it in as blog. And there we go. So now if anyone went to my code, they would see that, hey, I have an app called blog. And in this, it actually already built a bunch of things for me. It has a models file. It has a views file. It has an admin file. Those are the three main ones that we'll look at. We will also look at test too. But the main thing here is understanding that, yes, now we have something called models. And what models do is it allows us to store data in the database in a very specific way. Let's look at an absolutely basic version of that. And I'll say class. And this has to be a class. It cannot be a function. And what we're going to call it is simply blog post and it's models.model. Okay. So what this does is it allows us to declare fields that are going to be mapped into the database, but more importantly, something that's logical for the data that we need, right? So if I said title, well, that certainly makes sense for a blog post. And then I need to declare what this field is. And we do that with models. Let's just call it text field for now. That's it. That's all I'm going to leave for my model. So now I've got a new app and a new model. The rule of thumb is whenever you change models.py, you have to do at least two things. One of those things is inside of settings, make sure that your app is there, right? So after you do that once, you probably are good, right? The other thing is we need to ensure that this is in our database. And also any changes that I made to this are also in our database. So these two commands will be what you always, always run after models.py. And that is Python manage.py make migrations. And you might see something like this, right? So it made migrations. The next thing you would do is Python manage.py migrate. So those are the two commands that you'll always run make migrations and migrate. So if I wanted to add something here and said like content, save it. This time I'm going to go ahead and say null equals to true and blank equals to true. No worries. We'll talk about that soon. Let's go ahead and save it. What do we do? We run make migrations and then we run migrate. This ensures that what's on our model is also what's known in the database. So the database now knows about this model and we can start adding to it. But how do we do that? What I'm going to do is some real quick Python class understanding. So I'm going to make a new class here and just write blog. I'm not going to pass anything. You can pass the object, but that's inferred that it's an object. So you can write that if you'd like, or you can just leave it empty. I'll say title equals to hello world and content equals to something cool. Okay, so this is not Django. This is just pure Python. So if I go into the Python shell, just plain old Python shell, no need to do manage.py, and I copy this in here, and I run obj equals to blog, obj2 equals to blog, with those parentheses, I now have two objects, also known as an instance. So obj and obj2, those are also instances of this blog 
class or this blog object. So if I do obj, I should see something like this. If I do obj.title, I should see that. obj2.title, right? We should see all of these things. And then obj. underscore underscore class, we should see the actual class, the same as what we declared for it, right? So Django models aren't actually a whole lot different than this, but instead of retrieving the data after we initialize it, we can actually use it in the database. So in other words, if I said obj2.title equals to another title and did obj2.save, that would then save it in the database. Now, of course, this default class doesn't do that, but Django has that in by default. So if I do obj2.title, of course it's showing me that title. But if I exit out of here and go back into Python and try to type out obj.2, it's not even defined, right? Blog's not even defined. Like none of those things are defined. Now, of course, I assume that you know this. If you don't know it, that was a nice little introduction to how classes work. And if you do know it, it's a really easy way to save data into the database. All right, so let's get rid of this example save everything here. I'm going to exit out of this Python interpreter and then now go into the Django version with python manage.py shell. And then we're going to go ahead and import this class. So we'll do from blog.models import blog, or rather blog post, right? So it's that model. Now, if you're not familiar with how to get here, let me know in the comments, but it's really simple. We're starting this in manage.py. So the root of the Django project which if we break everything down um, pythonically, python manage.py can go into the blog with from blog, right? So that's a Python module itself. The blog module is in there because of that init file. So we can do from blog.models, import that blog post. Now I can go ahead and say obj equals to blog post, obj.title equals to this is my title, and obj.content equals to this is my content, and then obj.save. This time it's saying that it's missing the requirement for self. Of course it is, I didn't initialize that instance very well. And there we go. Now I go ahead and save it, and what do you know? Does it seem like anything happened? Well, let's exit out of the shell and go back into the shell import that again, and then we're gonna do a query. So we're gonna actually look in the back end and I'll say obj equals to blog post dot objects dot get title equals to, well, this string right here. And if I do obj dot title, there it is, obj dot content, and there it is, right? So what did I do? I actually imported that object, created an instance of it correctly here, and then I saved that instance into the database, and then I exited out of the shell, and then went in and retrieved it from the database. So I can do that also with the Django admin. So I was able to save this data. Let's go ahead and add the blog model, the blog post model into the admin so I can do it there. And we're gonna go ahead and do from dot models, right? So the models module and the admin module are in the same module. So you can do a relative import and then we do import blog post. And then we just do admin dot site dot register blog post. That's how you actually bring it into the admin that has been convention for a long time. Um, and that's how you do it. Okay, so our model is named blog post. If you named it something different, it's completely okay. Typically with models, you don't wanna name it with a plural because you'll have a lot of instances of that object or that actual model, like we kind of started doing. We already have one instance, so it makes a lot more sense to do blog post. Okay, so this adds it to the admin. Let's go ahead and take a look. I'm gonna exit out of that shell and I'm gonna run the server again. And in our project, we'll go into the admin. And what do you know? I've got blog post in here. If I click on it, I have my first blog post. It has title and content. Not a whole lot of data going on here, but that's pretty cool. 
The next thing is I'll just make a new one called Hello World as my title and my content being just like ABC. Save that. I now have two objects in the database. Let's go ahead and query the database for those objects. Let's go into the shell. So Python managed py shell. We're going to go ahead and do from blog dot models import blog post. And we'll go ahead and say obj equals to blog post dot objects dot get title equals to hello world. I'm going off of memory here. I hit obj. I don't actually have a title matching that query. So maybe it was a lowercase w. Ah, looks like that worked. So I can do obj.title and sure enough, there it is. Now, there are more complex ways to actually look up this data, which we'll get into later. But as you see, it has a way to say does not exist and a way to actually get it if I did the right query. Now, another thing that's built into all models is an ID field. So obj.id, that's what these numbers signify. It actually shows me the ID of that object that it gets automatically incremented every time you save a new object. So another, let's go ahead and save another object. I'll say obj2 or rather obj3 equals to blog post and then we'll initialize it obj3.title equals to this is awesome again or something like that obj3.save. Notice I did not save or put any content in there. And now I can exit out of this. And let's press up a few times, run that server again, refresh in here, and sure enough, there are my three objects. So now that we have a way to store data in the database, um, it's time to actually view this data inside of a view. Haha. <laughs> now I showed you some methods on how to actually look up this data in the shell. Right, so if we click on any of them in the admin, we see that there's that number there, right? So that's that ID that it has by default, and every single one of them has that. So I actually wanna reference this blog post now from this ID. That's how I'm gonna actually grab this data. So let's go into Sublime Text and into Blog Views, and I'm gonna go ahead and import the blog model, and it's a relative import, so I can do from dot models import blog post and the object I want to grab is the blog post dot objects dot get and I'll just say ID equals to one and I know that that exists because if I go into the admin I can see that there's this object and the ID is actually listed there and it says one okay so now what I want to do is actually use this data in a view now you may remember we to create a view, we define a function here, and then we'll just go ahead and call this blog post detail page, and it takes in request as a default, and then returns render request, some template name, and some context. So let's actually make those as variables. I'll say template name and context, just like that. So it's a context dictionary and a template name string. So what do we even call the template name? Well, hey, why don't we just call it blog post detail .html. Actually, I think that makes sense. You call it the same thing as the view itself, right? With the exception of the last part. But now I know I can infer that this is absolutely a template. And then I just grab in this query, right? And the nice thing too, is I can actually pass in the entire object into this context. Right, so what I mean by that is I don't actually have to do like object.title and say title is equal to that. This passing of the object means that in my template, I can actually unpack what's inside of that object as well. So to actually make this work, of course, we have to create the template. And then what else do we have to do? We have to add this view into our URLs. So inside of my templates, I'm going to go ahead and make a new file in here and call it blog underscore post underscore detail dot HTML. Oops, I mean, got to make sure it's the correct extension. Okay. And if it wasn't the correct extension, it would still most likely render because as long as the template name is right and it's treated as HTML, it should work just fine. 
So as a reminder, we do extends base.html, and then we put in our block content in block. Okay, so back into our view, the context dictionary tells me the context variable is object. So now I can just do something like h1, curly brackets, object at title, h1, and then maybe like a p tag object.content. Now, if you don't remember these, the dot notation, dot whatever, is coming from the field names, right? So I have two fields in here. So that allows me to do that dot notation in the template as well. It's not really any different than what we were doing in the shell when we were doing obj.title, right? It's the same thing. Okay, cool. So now that we've got that, we've got a template, we've got a view. It's time to add this into our URLs. So into our URLs, we will add this view. So from blog.views import, and we'll import that detail view or that blog post detail page. And of course, it's not a relative import this time around, right? It's relative for the project, of course. So I have to actually go to the blog module itself and then import the views like that. And now what I'll do is add another path here and I'll just call it blog and it'll render out this detail page. So we save that and let's go look at it. Just going into blog. And sure enough, I got this is my title, this is my content. If I wanna change that, I go back into my view and I change the ID that it looks up by. And then I refresh in here. Looks like it's the same content. And then the third one is different content. Cool, so we now have a way to actually look at that detail. It's really not that complicated. It's pretty cool. And we also know that this database that's driving this data, right? So this query right here, that's what it is. It's called a query that goes into the database. The database returns the data and then Django renders it. That's essentially what's going on here. Pretty cool. So if we look at our URLs now, we see that the blog post detail page is sort of static. Like it's not dynamically looking for this, right? I actually had to set this value inside of the view itself. So what I wanna do is have a dynamic URL so my view is also dynamic. In other words, I wanna be able to pass an argument with my URL and then have my view update based off of what the argument is. And using the URL pattern for path, it's actually fairly straightforward. We put in these brackets here, and then we say an integer and an ID. So you say what the data type is, like a Python data type, and then in my case, it's gonna be an ID. So when you do that, this actually passes in a, an additional argument into your view in this case, we named it ID. But if I called it post ID, then it would pass in post ID. And then with that number, whatever that is, we could add it in to our lookup, okay? So now with these two things, it's a lot more dynamic. We look in our blog and that URL, it's no longer rendering out anything. And of course that's because we changed our actual blog to have a dynamic item. So let's look back at that URL, right? So if I wanted to have a, another way of doing this, right? So I'd actually want to have a list of items here at some point, right? To handle that root blog path. I'll leave that commented out for now. But if we go back in here, I can change my URL to have a number, right? So one, or two and so on. Now, of course, if I said ABC, it automatically infers and says page not found. Right? It doesn't even try to go to that endpoint because we declared that data type. Um, so if this was an, a string, it would give me some other error, right? And this error is because of our lookup. I'll explain that in a second. But the idea is if we want this to be sort of strict 
to a data type, we would use an integer. And that means that then something like this will go to page not found, where something like 500 will give me a does not exist error, which is no surprise. I don't have 500 items in my database at all. I only have three. So the max value would be three. Cool. So that's how we can dynamically load these views. Now, of course, it doesn't have to actually look up anything, right? I could just make it where it's only showing whatever that number is, but it makes a lot more sense to have it look up something. And notice that our URLs really haven't changed a whole lot. We now just have a dynamic URL here. But before we go away, there is another way to write this, and I'm just gonna show you it. Don't worry if you don't fully understand, but if you were to use regular expressions, which is what you'll see a lot with my stuff, it would be something more like this. Post ID slash D plus and dollar sign at the end. Okay, so these two are actually representing the exact same value and the exact same response. So uh, the regular expression right here is looking for only digits, only numbers, and it's going to render to this keyword value. This is just a shortened version of that. And it used to be inside of URL. This is one of those minor changes in Django that aren't major, but if you're a beginner, they could be rather frustrating. But that's something that's important to note, especially if you watch older versions of stuff. Pretty cool. We just saw an error occur that we don't want to, right? So if I have str in here and change it to abc, this is an error I definitely don't wanna see, right? And the same is true as if I went to integer here and just did like a thousand, right? I don't wanna see these errors. These are actually server errors. So if this was live, the user would be like, what is going on here? This is not correct. Well, there's a couple ways on how I could go about solving this, right? I can go the hard way or the long way, and that is first and foremost going from django.http import HTTP 404. So what this allows me to do is raise what's called a 404 page. So I can literally put this object lookup into an exception handler and just literally raise HTTP 404, right? So with that, then I get this page not found on those two items, assuming that this is back to str, right? It's giving me a page not found for either one. And then the ones that are valid, it won't give me that page not found. Okay. So usually when you write exception blocks though, you wanna be more explicit to what the actual exception is. In other words, let's take a look at another exception. If I do 12, we got blog post matching query does not exist. This is a do not exist exception or does not exist exception. So we would actually want to handle that exception itself. So it'd be blog post dot does not exist. And of course this is the model name that does not exist. Then you would handle that exception. So I, let's get rid of this example here, refresh. And now it's doing that page not found. But if I go back into ABC again, it's giving me another exception of value error. Okay, so what would I do? I would say accept value error. That's a standard Python error. We say raise HTTP 404. And sure enough, it does it. Okay, but as you might imagine, this is starting to get cumbersome and it's probably not valid. It's probably not a good way to actually write this view, but it's important to see that errors happen and you do need to back up and, and try and diagnose as to what's going on. You will absolutely need to do that in the future. We will show you a way to shortcut this, but it's important to see it and also understand that when you're designing your URLs, it's also important to understand what data types are gonna be being passed in your URL shortcut like this, right? So this is a dynamic URL but it's being strict and it's saying it's only allowed to be integers. Otherwise, it's gonna raise that 404 error for us, right? It's, it's gonna do this on our behalf because it's not a valid URL. 
Uh, that's also true with the regular expression value as well. So our lookup here rendered regardless of what that data type was. In other words, it attempted to render when it was an STR. And in some cases it actually worked. In other cases it did not, right? So when it was ABC, it doesn't work. It says page not found. But when it's one, it does work. Let's actually take a look at the data type that's coming through by doing print post ID dot underscore underscore class. So we're looking at the class that's being passed in here. We'll refresh in our view. Let's make sure the server is running. The class is string, right? No huge surprise here because in the URL, it's a string. What if I change it to int? Refresh in here, the class is integer. Hmm. So it does actually have that dynamic class being rendered, but my lookup, regardless of what the class was, is still trying to look things up, right? So if this was an integer or a string, it would try and look it up. And if it is a string, it would actually work. In other words, if I said str here, to make it a string, as far as the lookup is concerned, regardless of what my URL says, I refresh in here, it's still working, right? Because what Django is gonna end up doing is say, hey, this is an ID field, or any of these fields can be lookups. The ID is ID equals to models.integer field, right? So it's automatically gonna look it up based off of that. But when it queries the database, a string of one and the number of one, as in, you know, let's look at the Python, right? So one is one, and then the string of one is also considered one in this lookup because the string of one times, you know, 200 gives you this, where the one times 200 gives you 200. Um, so both of those things are interpreted the same way when you do this lookup which is why we are also getting that value error. It's gonna try to do that lookup regardless of what the actual data type is. But of course, I actually want a more streamlined way to do this, and that is get object or 404. So in this case, I'll say object equals to get object or 404, the name of the model itself, and then the field I wanna look it up by, which in my case was that ID field. At this point now, I can actually get rid of this. We can get rid of that class call. We save that. We refresh in here. After we run the server again, let's exit out of that Python shell. And sure enough, it loads that. If I go to some page that's not found, it will do that. If I go to ABC, well, I still have the URL as an integer, so it does page not found. So this is, this is absolutely valid as it is. Now, yet again, if I do str here and then refresh in here, it still gives me that value error. This should be hopefully of no surprise because that's not a valid value for an integer field. It is a valid value for a text field or a character field, but it's not valid for an integer field. And then therefore we would probably wanna handle this in another way. Um, or you just need to know for sure that, hey, when I'm doing this kind of lookup, I need to make sure that this is an integer field. Okay. I've seen that happen a number of times where these lookups were invalid. Um, that's why you want to play around with them. So let's, let's look at um, how we can do this in a little different way too. So what did I actually start with the lookup of being ID? Hopefully you were wondering that. If you weren't, it's really simple. If you go into the admin and you select any of these items, you notice that there's a one in the URL. If I change that one to being a two, it changes the data. If I change it to being a three, it also changes the data. So the Django admin actually works off of this same sort of methodology, but that's actually not where I want it to be. I don't want my project based off of how the admin is. I don't want it based off of an integer at all. Instead, I want it to be something closer to actually ABC or like my blog post. That I actually much prefer because 
Well, the URL's a lot easier to read, and therefore it's a lot easier to remember. Or if you had a blog post called Getting Started, like, hey, I can pass that URL a lot easier than that was object 3241 or whatever, right? So that means that we need to adjust how our view is going to look up our data. Whether it's this method or this method, we need a new way to look up this data in our database. Now, if we look at our model, these are the three fields that are in there by default. The ID field is also known as the primary key. So both ID and .pk, both of those things will work. Uh, we have a title and we also have content. So I don't have a lot to look up off of. So what I need is something called a slug. And we do models.slug field. And I'll leave it like that. So the slug itself has to do with this right here. So a slug is a URL encoded value. So with URLs, I can't do like something like, hello there, this is an awesome, you know, dollar sign, all this stuff. Like that's not a very valid URL. In fact, even the URL itself uses these percent sign, percent 20 to replace the actual space that was there. So slug fields do that too, but they replace it to make it look a little bit better. So hello world becomes something more like hello world, or that's actually a valid slug field. So now that we've got this, I've added it into my model. What do I need to do? Well, I made changes to my model. So I need to close out my server, python manage.py, make migrations, and then Whoa, what's this? This is a new error that you may or may not have seen before. You are trying to add a non-nullable field slug to blog posts without setting a default. So this is Django doing a test to ensure that when you make some changes to your database, that the database knows how to handle those changes. In other words, I just added a new field, but I have you know three values currently, right? So what do those need to put for slug, right? For this new field, what do I put for them? And Django by default is saying it can't be null, right? So it can't be empty in the database. If I wrote null equals to true, it's not gonna have this error. If I, another way to do this would be say default equals to, this is my slug. Right, I could set a default value too. Either one of those, if I set that, it wouldn't have told me to do this. And of course, I do have a one-off default that I can set for all existing rows or otherwise all values that are currently in your database. You see, when you create databases, you wanna make sure that Django and the database have the same mapping, right? And when I say mapping, I mean this maps to the database, this maps to the database, this maps to the database. And Django by default is saying, hey, this isn't in the database. You're adding it to a pre-existing database. We need to know if you can make it null in the database or just not even in the, like the actual value itself can be empty in the database. Or you set a default for the actual value in the database for everything that's currently in our database. So if we had 10,000 items in our database, this would set all 10,000 of those in our database. Or if you said null equals to true, all 10,000 of those would also be empty. They just wouldn't be there. Cool. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set a one-off default. I'll just say one. So that's my option. And now I'll go ahead and say hello-world. Okay, I hit enter. I added this field now. I ran migrations, but I didn't do the other part, which is Python manage.py migrate. So now it's in the database, okay? So let's go ahead and take a look at our admin. Let's run the server again. And we look in here and what do you know? We've got a slug in each one of these items and they all say, hello world. Great. So, Let's go ahead and change our view, or rather our URL and view 
to be an str and it's going to be the slug now it's no longer going to be the post id so one quick way to do that with regular expression something like that okay so we've got our slug here now so our view this should be slug actually name it slug and then now our lookup is no longer the id field but rather the slug field so we do slug equals to that past argument of slug so those are two examples of that lookup and now it doesn't look up by the id at all it only looks up by that slug field so naturally when we go to this one it's going to say not found when i go to one not found right but as soon as i go to hello dash world as in the value that i set by default for in my case three different blog posts i hit enter it gives me another error like what the heck what's all these errors all about well this is actually a good thing and i'll explain why in a moment but the idea here is we've changed the way we actually look up this data in the database all right multiple objects return this is a common error that a lot of django beginners see and that's because the lookups aren't always exactly clear how we're going to do it. So let's go ahead and take a look at what I mean. We have two kinds of lookups, this one and this one. They're doing the same thing, except this one just renders 404 if it's not found. So the key part of both of them is this get call. So get apply, like implies that there's going to be one object. Whereas filter applies that there's going to be a list of objects. So filter is another way to actually narrow down some content, right? So let's go ahead and say this, we've got obj equals to objects.filter. But again, it's not one single item. Instead, what it's called is a query set. That is a very common term in Django. This right here is a query set. It's going to filter out my entire database for this matching value. In other words, it's searching the database for this value being matching. So you can change the field that it's looking for, right? We could change it based off of title, content, whatever. And anything that matches that will come back in this query set. So let's take a look. In the terminal, we're gonna open up the, the Django shell with python manage.py shell, and then we'll do from blog.models import blog post and our, we said our slug was hello dash world so again we do blog post dot objects dot get slug equals to slug what should we see here we get the multiple objects returned so we press up and change git to being filter we get back what's called a query set which has all three of those objects not a huge surprise here, but this is filtering down what's in our database so we can now see them. So one of the ways to compensate for this error is to say QS equals to that query, whatever that is, and then we can do QS.first. So this is a method on a query set, like literally a Django query set. This will grab that first object and it will give us back something, right? With that same thing being said, you can also do last. And since it's a Python list, we can do some sort of index value. So this would be the second item, right? Because we have a full list here. Okay. So these query sets help account for our slug being a problem. Like if we have that same slug over and over again. So what I'm actually going to do is I'll exit out of this and we'll run our server again. Now what I'm going to do is say, if queries or if um, the query set dot count, this is another method. You would use that instead of the length of query set for those of you Python users. If query set dot count is not equal to one, then we would raise an HTTP 404. That's sort of one way to handle that. And then we would just say our object is equal to the query set dot first. Okay. So this would handle that error for us. And if it is the same error, right, it's going to say 404, not found. So that's one way to handle that query set. Another way would be to say 
If it is equal to one, then we can give that object being that, or we could just say if it's greater than that, greater than or equal to that, we can just get whatever is first in that query set. And then that way it will ignore all of those other values. That's a good and bad thing. Um, it's good in the sense that, hey, it works. And now I'm not getting these weird errors. It's bad in the sense that now I'm missing content from my page. I actually have two other posts with the same slug. So we probably need a better way to ensure that our slugs are unique. So this seems to solve a number of problems for me. Now, one of them that it still won't solve is an invalid data type. So if I change that to ID, I'll still get this invalid data type. That's definitely not something that's gonna solve now. Um, but what it does solve is the same object with the same actual lookup, in this case, the same slug all across a few different objects, however many. Um, what it also does is it will still, hmm, we get this error. Of course, the reason I'm getting this error is because I don't have that object set up down here. So what I would want to do is just say else raise HTTP 404, right? So it's, it's basically saying that, or better yet, we would say if it's equal to zero, as in there are none, then we would go ahead and raise that error. Okay, great. So now we've got that. So it works on hello world, but of course that slug is redundant. We've used it multiple times. So there's another way to actually fix this. And that is to change our slug from just being anything can do it to unique equaling to true. Now this might be something I wanna actually put into my database. But before I save this, before I actually start the migration process, I wanna go into my database and change all of the current values of hello world. All right, all of those non-unique values, I wanna make them unique because now that I've got this, I can close out my server, python manage.py make migrations, and then python manage.py migrate. Now, if you didn't change your database, you might have a bunch of different errors come up there. So that's why it's also important to do a lot of these things testing locally and get this model really right prior to actually releasing this in, in a real production application or a real world application. So now it's a little bit closer to what I want and I can now bring my view back to being just that object because now that my slugs are all unique, it's better fit to this ID of integer field Right, so those are all unique to default. That's how they work. But now all of my slugs can only be unique, which is even more clear when we run the server again. And we go ahead and add a blog post here and I'll say new post. And I try to use hello um, world and I hit save and continue. I get a validation error. This is called a validation error that's saying that this is not valid data because this already exists, right? We said it was unique, it had to be unique. Um, what if I just leave it empty? I hit save and continue. And it says this field is required. I told you I'd explain these two values. This new value, this field is required, that's related to this blank, right? So if I change that to blank being true, I'm not gonna leave it this way, uh, but notice that I can now have it as an empty field. But of course, I don't wanna leave it that way because my database cannot be null. So we wanna make sure that that is blank equals to false, which is the actual default. Cool, so now that we have the unique clause, it's time to actually build out more of our views. Whenever we go to a web page, we are requesting data from that web page. This is called a request. Django treats it as the name request. So we can also see when we request a web page by literally reloading a page, we see how many times we reloaded it and what's going on, right? So it's doing a type of request and to a specific URL, right? 
And if we back up to the home page, we see that it's requesting that page then, right? And then we refresh and so on. So what's actually happening here is that request goes into the URLs, right? So the user is looking for a specific URL. That URL is then sent to Django. Django then parses that URL and looks in these patterns for any matching patterns. And if there is one, it's gonna then send that request to the view that handles it, right? And then from that view, we can return some sort of response or no response at all, but most likely you will return a response. So it kind of looks like this, right? We got a request, goes into Django, and then Django sends back a response, right? So Django's the server in this equation. Now our requests actually have things attached to them. So if I actually print out request.method, um, and I'll just go ahead and say Django says, and then we can also print out the request dot path, I can also print out request dot user, right? So the, re the request has a bunch of things attached to it by default from Django. So we look at this, I refresh in here several times. And what I see is Django says this stuff, right? So it's a get request, that's the method type. And then we've got the path, and then the actual user. Now, why is it that I'm telling you about this? Well, when you typically go to grab data, you're typically doing a get request. A get request means that you're getting data, you're grabbing whatever that data is. And that's often in the form of grabbing it from your database as well, right? So there's no coincidence that grabbing one single object was blog post that objects that get that is somewhat correlated here, right? So it's still getting whatever that object is. So there's a concept in web development altogether called CRUD. So what CRUD is, is it takes this same concept of get, but expands it to several other methods that are in your standard web applications anyway. So we just talked about get, that's one kind of method that is to retrieve or even to list things. We'll get into the list stuff later. Then we have another method called post and that is to create things. Now let's go ahead and see a post method. If I go into the admin into adding a blog post and I'll say another blog post and blog post another or whatever and then we hit save and continue, it says it was made. If we look in the terminal, we see a bunch of Git requests here for our static files, no surprise there. And if we scroll up a little bit, we also see a post request, right? So that happened when I actually submitted a form. So that's when it was actually created. Now I'm on this thing here, I can, also update this form, I can hit save and continue. And it says there's changed successfully. I can look back in the terminal. And once again, it's a post method. So I can use that for update as well. And then what about when I want to delete something? So let's go ahead and just delete this item. I'll say yes, I'm sure I hit delete. And yet again, another post method. So I can use post for all of those as well. Now there actually are literal HTTP methods for update and delete too. And I'll talk about those just briefly later, but we now have the basis of a web application and that's CRUD. So that stands for create, retrieve, update and delete. So our admin has these CRUD views already, even though it might not have seen like it, right? So when I come in here and I look at one object, this is retrieving that object. That's the same thing as this or getting that object. And then I already just showed you the create and delete stuff. So what we need to do is make views for each aspect of CRUD. So define, and then I'm gonna call this the blog post list view. And again, it's gonna take in the request and then it will return a response 
I'm going to go ahead and paste out these for each level of CRUD. Okay, so we've got a list view, and then we have a retrieve view, then we're going to have an update view, a create view, and a delete view. Okay, so I could put it in the order of CRUD, just so you see. The list view is a version of the retrieve view. So it's going to have a specific method for that. But this is what we want to work towards. We want to actually have all of these different views to actually handle the data in that CRUD way. And this is common across all web applications. Now I will say that sometimes these views can do all of these things. Sometimes they do only one of them. We're going to focus on just doing one of them and we'll go by step by step. We have five different CRUD like views. So the list view can list out objects, right? This could also be a search view. We're not going to do that, but the idea here is that we're going to list out some sort of objects and we're going to return those objects as its specific URL. So naturally our template name is going to be the blog post list.html. The context, well, it's going to have to be some sort of list. I'm going to use the convention of object list and I'll leave it empty for now. Okay. Because I want this to actually return a list of items and that's it. The next one is the create view, right? So what do we want to do here? Let's go ahead and use very similar syntax. This time we'll just say create.html. This one, I actually want to be able to create objects, but how? Well, we would use a form. So we don't have forms yet and we don't know how to use forms yet. So we're not going to do that just yet, but the context variable itself would be the form. Like we'll want to have some sort of form in here and that's going to be an object. So I'll just leave it as a string or an empty string for now, or you could even say none. Okay. The next is the blog post retrieve view. Well, very similar to the create view. Of course, the template name is different post retrieve. And this is going to be one object or the detail view. That's actually a better term for it. And it's actually why we were calling the blog post detail page. Detail view is often what you would call a retrieve view. Because again, the list view and the detail view are both retrieving data in the sense of CRUD. But one is for one single object, the other one is for several objects. So we're going to call this the post detail view. Now we already have how to do this. We already did it. So I can just adjust things slightly here and bring it into that view as well. Okay, so that's already done. Great. The next is the update and delete view. So update and delete will have to grab that original object. So they're actually based off of that original object for both of them, right? So I want to update an object. I want to change something in it. And then I also might want to delete something in it. Okay, so what happens in the update view is similar to the create view, except we actually pass an object. So yet again, I'm going to add a form in here as some of my context. All right. So of course, I don't actually know what all of these things are going to do exactly yet, or we don't. Uh, but I do know that I now have a structure to work towards. And this is true across all kinds of apps in web application in general. It's also true about in Django, right? So in Django itself, we are going to be working through these views to ensure that our blog is working in the way that we want it to. Now you don't have to do all this because so much of CRUD is handled by the admin itself right now, which is a good way to actually check against what we're doing. In other words, to check against our views and how they are handling this data. That's also pretty cool. 
Now that we understand where we want to go, it's time to talk about more advanced querying of the database with Django. In other words, it's time to look at our models on another scale. The first thing that we would need to do in our blog post list is actually send in a query set of some kind, which QS is often the variable that's attributed to this, and it's literally blogpost.objects.all. So dot objects is a Django manager that allows me to call dot all so I can literally get all of the objects in the database and I don't have to modify anything. I don't have to add anything to the admin or the models or anything like that. It's literally just this one call and that will allow me to have some sort of query set come back that is really just a list of objects. So it's a list of Python objects that we can use dot notation to see what's inside of that query set. So that's a list view that will literally list it all out. Okay, cool. So let's go ahead and finish off this list view. Let's actually look at it with a template. So I'm going to go in my templates and I'm going to make a new folder in here, or actually I'm going to go to my templates. I'm going to make a new file in here and I called it blog post list .html. Okay. Blog post list. And just like our detail one, I can copy all this and paste it in here. But this time it's coming back with a list instead of, you know, the actual objects. So we would iterate through. So for object in object list, and then we would display all of that. Now, of course, in a list view, you probably don't want to have it look like a detail view, right? So this is actually rendering out all of the details currently. So instead, what I'm going to do is just put it into a list element and use the object.title and that's it. Okay, so now that we have a list and the view associated to it, I'm going to go ahead and copy this and import it into my URLs. So from these views, I'm going to import it in. And now I can bring back that original blog path and put that as my view, which I think makes the most sense, right? So if somebody got rid of the slug or the detail lookup URL, it would go to the list. Let's go ahead and check it out. Get rid of that. And what do you know? It's a list of all of my blog posts. Now I will say, this is getting a little bit more advanced, but I will say that you can filter this down. You can use that dot filter notation to have it be based off of something like title I contains, let's say hello, all right? So this would filter down, down to probably one. So I refresh in here and now it only shows me one object, right? So that's where the could be search comes in. But we'll leave it in as dot all because that's more realistic to how we're building our list view. Now that we've finished our list view, let's go to our blog create view. This takes a form as context. So I can't really go into this just yet, but I will make my template at least. And I'm gonna make it based off of the blog post detail. So I'll copy that and I'll go ahead and say blog post create. HTML, and we'll paste that in there and we'll just say create new blog post. Save that and we bring that view, so the blog post create view, we bring that into our URLs and I'm going to import things in alphabetical order. And now what I can do is I can make another endpoint for blog create and we would say something like that. Now, the reason I actually am not gonna go this method is because slugs and create end up causing potential issues. So what I'm gonna do instead then is just do blog dash new. All right, so this is a completely different endpoint, so I'll go ahead and put it below, and there we go. Okay, so then now 
to just verify that that's in there, we'll just go to blog dash new. And now we have that template actually rendering, right? Okay. So yeah, we definitely have to come back to that and do a lot of things there. We have our blog post detail view. If we go into our URLs, we're just going to change our blog post detail page to the detail view. They're really not any different, but um, now we have our actual blog items. Looks like I had a import error. I just want to make sure that the detail page is no longer there. Okay, so we go back to our blog and then something like hello world. All right, so it's still rendering. So that view is good. That also means that I can probably get rid of this. Okay. Um, next is the update view. Same thing as the create view. I'm going to just go ahead and copy this, make a new file, blog post update.html. Uh, in this case, it's not actually different than the detail view. We can leave it as the same. So I'll bring in that detail view stuff. And while I do that, I'm going to do the same thing for the blog post delete. Okay. The only difference is I'll just append something that's related to it as in delete and updates. And then finally, I'll go ahead and import those two views into my URLs, update view and delete view. Going back up here. Let's go ahead and just copy and paste a couple times, change these update and delete. So to me, the logical paths or URLs for that would be something like slash edit and then slash delete. Okay, so we update it and put the different views where they need to go. Okay. So we now have the views mounted and set up. We have the URLs routed correctly. Um, it's time to do one more thing related to URLs before we jump into the forms. If you remember back to the settings when we went to the installed apps, I said each one of these apps should do one thing and one thing really, really well. Another idea is that they should be mostly pluggable. What I mean by that is, grabbing this block of code here, the actual app, and dragging and dropping it into a, another project that needs that same kind of app. I don't want to repeat myself at all, but if I have to repeat myself, I want to do it as little as possible. And that's where the pluggable comes in. Right now, it is not pluggable. And it starts with the URLs. So the URLs right here are just simply not that great. They are repeating at least one thing right here. And you also might imagine if you had, let's say 10 different apps, your URL page is gonna to start to get fairly bloated. So we already have an example of something that works really well that we can also emulate. And that's the admin URLs, right? So the admin URLs doesn't have all of this bloat because the admin is pluggable and it has a URLs module inside of it. So we come into our blog and we make a new URLs module as just straight up URLs. And we can literally copy our main site URLs and bring them in here, paste them in. But of course we only want the URLs and the comments that are related to the blog, right? So to the relative views. So I'm going to go ahead and do dot views, import all those things, get rid of those other views. Um, I also am only going to have the path in here. I'll get rid of the Django admin stuff because I don't need that. And then I'll just go one by one and get rid of the things that I don't want, which is anything not related to the blog. Cool. Now that I have this, what I want to think about is in my URLs, do I get rid of these things now? Well, of course, you don't need them anymore. Actually, the only one I'm going to leave is this create view. I'll get rid of all of the other CRUD related items. And I'll also get rid of the imports for them. Okay, but I still want my paths to be the same. 
And we actually already have a example inside of Django's docs as it is. So all you need to do now is actually import the include block here. And then again, setting a path. And this is going to be blog with a slash at the end. And this is going to include the blog.urls. So what this does is then looks into the blog app, into the URLs module, and it looks for the URL patterns like this. But notice how they all start with blog, or this right here starts with blog, and these all start with blog. I don't need those twice. I only need it one time. So I can actually get rid of all these. And I'll also get rid of the create one. Okay, so we save that. And we look back into our URLs here. And there we go. So we've got our blog here. And I can refresh. And it looks like things are still working. All right? So the path itself is coming here. And path is coming here. So if I actually kept, let's say, for instance, I kept blog on all of these. I'll just simulate it right now. Let the server restart. And now it's saying blog, blog, like I literally would have to have blog in it twice, which is valid. It's just kind of weird. Like you can certainly do this. It just doesn't really make sense for what we're doing. So I'll go ahead and get rid of that. And that is a, a much more effective way to actually have our URLs come in. Now, why is it that I have this create view separate from these URLs? It, everything has to do with the slug itself, right? So if you actually had a slug for your blog and that slug was new or create or something that would actually reference this create view, you would have a hard time diagnosing where it's coming from because you wouldn't be able to see that view. What I mean by that is, let's go ahead and take a, uh, a look at this, but by calling it hello world and going into that blog post itself, refreshing in here, it says create a new blog post. It's not actually going to that hello world post. So the same would be true if we used create or new, it would go off of that view first and then every other view that comes after it, which again is why I'm doing blog dash new right now. That way the actual lookup is going to where it needs to go. So this should inform you the last important part about these URLs is that it's reading them from top to bottom. So whatever it matches with first, that's what it's going to stop at and then render the related views for that. And in the case of the blog.urls or this include call, it will go through all of those URLs first and then it will come back and do all of these. It's pretty cool. There is certainly a, another element that we have to consider when it comes to making this more pluggable and it has everything to do with our templates or more specifically our blog templates. So let's go ahead and go to our detail and I'm just gonna change the name of the detail real quick to something that doesn't exist. So blog underscore post underscore detail two. We save that, we go to a detail view, refresh, you see this error. So if you look at what's going on here is it's trying to load the template by looking into the file system loader into our templates directory. It's looking for post detail 2html What it's also trying to do is it's trying to look into the app directories. So right now, the only templates directory in the app are related to the admin app and the auth app. Right. So in other words, it's looking for template directories in all of these apps, including our blog app. And all it found was template directories in here. And then it looked specifically for that file name, which of course doesn't actually exist here. So what that means is I can actually come into my app and make a new folder in here called templates. So this is the app directory level of templates. We have our file system or our custom templates right here, which are denoted by that file system loader that are denoted right here. No surprise there. So if we actually add in a templates folder to our blog, we can put them in here. So let's go ahead and solve that problem 
which I just called, uh, I believe was blog post detail to dot HTML. We save that. And now if I refresh in here, I should, let's restart our server here. And now I get an empty page, right? So this actual template here doesn't have anything. Okay. So I can easily move all those templates over. So let's go ahead and reveal all these in Finder. And I'm gonna move them over to my blog app now. Okay, so here they are. Let's close them out inside of our project. And let's go ahead and grab all of them that are related to the blog post and we'll bring them into that templates directory now. Okay, so they're all moved. And I'm gonna rename this back to just being one and I'll delete that two here. So I'll go ahead and delete that file. Okay, great. Restart the server again because we now have moved all of those and what do you know? It loads them up. And we go into the blog and we can check every single one if we need. Okay, so this is close, but we actually wanna go one step further and that is by creating a new folder in here with the same name of the app and put them all in there. In fact, we can also rename them in here as well to what they are. So create, delete, detail, list, and finally update. Okay, so now we've got these items in here. I'm going to change the template names for each one. And it's really simple. We just put a slash just like that for each level. And then we rerun our server again, just close it out, rerun it, go in here and what do you know? It reloads and it works just fine. So now this app, I could send you this whole app and it would be exactly the same. All you'd have to do is put it into the settings right here and then add in these two URLs. That's what a lot of third-party apps do, right? They don't actually put it into the file system folder here. But the nice thing about doing it this way is that if you did send me your pluggable app like this and I wanted to make a custom change, I could just come into these templates and do blog and do something like detail.html and literally change it right here. So these templates will actually override what you have inside of any of your apps. So that's another cool feature of them. Of course, I'm not gonna do that. I'll delete that folder, we don't need it. Um, but now we have just a little bit cleaner of a way and a more pluggable way for our app itself prior to jumping in to doing the forms. And before we jump in to handling forms in our app, we're gonna go ahead and do it in our contact page. So that contact page view, making sure that we still have it wrapped in and it's still there. All right, so I'm gonna change the template from hello world to form.html. So that means in my templates, I'm gonna make a new one called form.html. And this is going to extend, so extends from base.html and it's gonna take in some block content. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and put a form in and this is just a raw HTML form. So the first thing you can do is input type and you can say something like text and give it a name. In my case, I'll say full name. Um, you can also do input type email and give it an email. And then you can do text area also with a name and just say content. And then you can also do a button type equals to submit and we'll just say send. Okay, so now let's make sure our view has form.html and it also has this context. So we'll add that into our form and I'll just say if title 
I'll do h1 title. The reason I did this is because I have this h1 tag here. If you just did raw title, that h1 tag would still be there. It just would have something empty. So I just did it like that. All right, so now let's go to our contact page. I believe it's just slash contact. And we have contact us twice. And the reason for that is our base.html. We have this right here. So let's go ahead and get rid of that. And we'll just be working off of this block content. Okay. So now I can fill out this form however I like, right? So my name and then maybe my email and then hi there. And I can hit send. What forms do by default is what's called a get request, right? So they put all of those parameters into the URL. That is done by default if you don't declare what kind of method it is. So back in the form, we did not declare the method. So let's go ahead and change it to being method type of post. There's another thing you can add in here called action. Action means what endpoint do we want to send it to? In our case, we're sending it to contact. However, we don't actually have to put that if the view that's rendering that form, like in our case, it's this view, we can actually just put a period there or leave it empty altogether. And it will submit to the same view that is handling it. Of course, if you wanted to have this on a different view, you can do that as well. So go ahead and try out action after you understand what we're about to. So now, if I refresh in here, let's go ahead and go back into contact, just raw contact there, put my name in, put an email and some message and hit send. Now I get this CSRF token verification. This is built in security by Django. All we need to do here is CSRF underscore token, and that will render the necessary field to allow me to submit this data. So I'm going back in and Try it again. This time I hit send. No errors happen. The form is cleared out. Um, and well, it seemed like something happened. Like the data went away. So what actually happened? Well, our view actually did handle this request, but we didn't see any of that data. So what we can do is we can print out the request data that's coming through. In my case, it's request post, it's post data, right? So that would be a way to do it. Now, if I just go to this page and look at that print statement, I am not sending post data. I'm using a get method. So this isn't just an empty dictionary. But if I actually submit it again, now what I'll see is all of that data. So we've got our CSRF token. This is a security token. So no other web page can just submit this data. And then we have all of our fields filled out. That's pretty cool. So that means that our data is actually rendering in a raw form. We do not want to use the raw form data though. Instead, what we want to do is have Django forms handle it for us. So now what we can do is create a form for this contact page. So I'm going to go ahead and put it inside of this configuration directory, and I'm going to call it forms.py. Now, typically you would have your views and forms in NAP, right? I'm doing this as an illustration purposes, not something you would want to use long term, because what we're actually building up towards is really just making our app reusable. So we're going to go ahead and come in here and do from Django, we're going to import forms and we're going to make a new form class. And this is going to just be our contact form and inherits from forms.form. And now we want to have a few fields. So the fields in here, we want to have our full name. We want to have our email and we want to have some content. Okay. So the full name is going to be equal to forms.char field or character field. The email itself will be forms.email field or an email field, right? And then finally, content is also forms.char field. 
Okay. And we can pass in a different widget and say forms.text area. We'll see what that looks like in a second. Okay, so with this, I'm gonna go into my view. I'm gonna bring it in here. So we'll do from.forms. I'm gonna import that form. And now what I'm gonna do is say the form is equal to that. And then we'll actually pass in this post data or none. As in, if this post data is empty, it's not really gonna do this next step, which is validating the form. And we'll just say if form dot is valid, go ahead and print out form dot cleaned data. No worries, we'll go over this stuff in just a moment. So we save that. Let's get rid of that posted data now. And let's look back at our raw form here. I might have to restart the server again. And I've got this attribute area. I think I have a spelling or capitalization problem. This should be a lowercase a. That, of course, could be looked up on the Django docs. And let's go ahead and rerun that server. Okay. So now um, I don't see anything that's related to Django here still. It's still that raw form, right? So it's still form.html here. Okay, so I can submit it again and hit send. Look at my terminal and what do you know? I now have a dictionary that's actually related to Django. So what I actually did was I sent that requested data, the request post data, and I validated it. I don't know how it validated, but I know that it did, right? Because of this block here. So again, I don't know how it validated, so I will have to check out validated. And the way I do that is by using the Django form instead of our raw form. So I'm actually gonna pass in that form instance to the template itself. I'm gonna update how I write out my context here. I'm gonna pass this like that. And then in my form itself, instead of having these three inputs here, I can render out that form and just do form.asp. So the form is being passed as context. So we see here, this is the form class itself. That form, of course, is coming from a Django form. And then in our template, we actually render it like this. Okay. So now I refresh in here and the form has changed. I now have labels for everything. And if I hit send, it's still sending that data, but it's also not refreshing that form. It's keeping that data there. So if I were to want to refresh it, I could just reiterate that form or reinitialize that form rather. And then this is how I'd reinitialize it. So I resubmit it and now it's a clean form. And now it's all coming from Django. So if I actually submitted a bad email, let's say for instance, like ABC at ABC, no extension and I hit send. Well, first of all, it's gonna make me fill out the fields that are required. And now I hit send, this is Django form validation right off the bat. So right there, it's cleaning and making sure that I have really good data. Um, so I'm actually not gonna go any further on this concept as far as the raw Django forms are concerned. There's a lot of things in the documentation to do that. Um, I will talk about validation more later, but now I think you're at a point where you're really close to being able to take this data and storing it into a model itself, into its own app and doing those sorts of things. Now what we want to do is use the same concept, but for creating new blog posts, right? So new model objects, we want to store that data in the database. Now, what we're about to do, you could absolutely use for this, but you would probably, in the case of contact form, you'd probably have a different model specifically for that. So let's go into our blog and we're gonna save this file as forms.py. And we'll go ahead and do from Django import forms. I'm gonna give it a class. This is gonna be my blog post form and it takes forms.form, okay? 
So the first thing that I want is the title, right? So this is forms.char field or character field. Then I'm gonna want slug and this is forms.slug field. And then finally content, right? Forms.char field. And in this case, we can do forms dot, or rather widget equals to forms dot text area. Okay, so now that we've got this, let's go ahead and bring this form into our create view, this one right here. So I'll go ahead and import it in. We'll do from dot forms, import the blog post form, and then naturally in our create view, we can say form equals to post blog form. And again, it's request dot post or none. And then if form dot is valid, then we'll go ahead and print out the validated data or cleaned data. Cool. Um, so naturally I'm gonna have this form in as context. And now I can actually think about what template I really need. I realize I made a template for the create, but perhaps I can use a different template, right? Perhaps in this create, I say form.html. And the reason for that is because we're just rendering out a form on this. It doesn't have to be like specific to that view. We can reuse this template over and over again, which is kind of cool. So naturally I can actually extend from that template itself. But that's sort of redundant information. Instead, what I should do is in my view, just change the template I'm using and say form.html. Now, if I was gonna make this absolutely pluggable, I would also make a form.html here that copies this other one. All right, so again, if I could drag and drop this somewhere, I would certainly wanna make sure I have that. Okay, cool. So I'm gonna be using the other one. So the templates, the original one, I'm not gonna be using this, this one that we just created. So now that I've got this, I've got form.html. I can actually take a look at this view and let's make sure our server's running. And then we're gonna go ahead and do blog new. And what do you know? I have my form in here and I could type out whatever I wanted and hit send. And when I hit send, I see that content come through. So this is the actual dictionary, All right? So I can save this data inside of my view, All right? So this is dictionary data, which means that I can grab each key value pair and say something like title equals to form dot clean data, and then the title, All right? And this would be really useful if you had a form for multiple models, right? And that's certainly, possible, right? So you might have 15 different fields in here and you want them to go to three different models, for example. This would be a way to do that. You actually grab the individual data and then you would do something like object equals to blog post dot objects dot create title equals to title. I realize you may have not seen this syntax yet. It's not a whole lot different than doing this and then obj dot title equals to title, uh, but this is the built-in Django method versus the Python method where you would then do obj.save, right? So this is just saves a little bit of time setting everything up. Okay, so of course, if you had another model, then you would do object two equals to other model.objects.create and then whatever you need to put here. So that's pretty cool. Of course, I'm not worrying about that right now. But instead what I can do, instead of actually getting each value from this data, I can just pass in that dictionary and unpack it with two stars form.cleaned data. What that does is it takes this dictionary and turns the key value pairs into arguments, much like we just saw, which is pretty cool. Okay, so now I can get rid of that. And after I save that data or create that data, I'll just do form equals to blog post form, and I'll just reinitialize that form. Okay, cool, so we save that, and let's try it out. I'm gonna actually send the same data that I had. I'll send it a couple times with a different slug, and we'll look in our admin for the blog posts, and what do you know? They're actually in there. Now this is pretty cool that I can do that now. I can save data from this form. But Django has something built in 
for forms and for models. They're called model forms. So basically what I mean is it's going to take the blog post model. So I'll call this blog post model form and it's forms dot model form. And I can actually use the model itself. So we say class meta model equals to, of course we need to import that model. So from the models import blog post model or rather just blog post. I think that's the name of our model. And we set our model down here in the meta class. And then we do fields equals to title, slug and content. Okay. So now I'm gonna go ahead and use this in my view, come in here and change our blog post form into our blog post model form. And now what I'm gonna do is just do form.save. I no longer need that create, I can just do form.save just like that. And again, I can reinitialize. So we save that, let's go back into that form. This time I'm gonna go ahead and make another new one. Ooh, our title has changed. We'll explain why in a moment. Another title, another slug, and some content. And we hit save, we look in our blog post, admin, and we refresh in there. And of course, there's our, our actual <laughs> blog post. Okay, cool. So a couple things happened. One of the things was this title, right? Why is it a big text area? Well, that has to do with our model, right? We actually, created the title as text field. Well, I probably don't want to have my titles being text field. Text field allows you to have a lot of data in there, right? So that makes a lot of sense for my content area, but not my title. My title should be char field or character field here. And we have to actually add in something called max length equaling to like 120 or 120 characters total. And then I'll go ahead and save that. Now, another way to accomplish this is to actually override the fields for each field that I'm bringing in, right? So I can actually use this same thing here, and this will actually convert it into a char field too. Now you can still use widgets, so you could keep it the same as it was like this, uh, but really this is probably the method I would end up going if I really just needed to change the form and not the model. But I wanna change the model because I don't need that. Okay. And another important part to note is that I just did form.save. You can't do that unless it's a model. So I can also manipulate some of that data by saying object equals to form.save commit equals to false. That means that it's not actually saving it. And then I could say object.title equals to form.cleaned data.get the actual title. So this is a dictionary, so we can call dot get on it and then just add something like zero or something like that, I don't know. And then object.save, right? So that allows me to manipulate some of the data inside of the form itself. So let's go ahead and do a couple things here. We have to, we made changes to the models. So we do python manage.py make migrations and then python manage.py migrate. And then we'll run the server again and we'll test this part out. We take a look at our blog post now now it's down to a field that makes sense. we we'll make some random slug. And notice that it ends with an S as the title. I hit send. I go into my blog post tier eight. It added a zero to the end because I added that zero string. Of course, I don't actually wanna do that, but it's nice to know that I can make some changes from the model form just like that. So that's model forms. They are pretty cool. They're based off of the model itself. And then you would just declare what fields from that model you want to include. If you remember back to our contact form and I used something like ABC at ABC with some whatever other information, it said enter a valid email address. That is called form validation. Now we can have our own custom form validation as well. So let's look at the email itself. Right, so what I wanna do is I'm gonna make my own custom form validation. So I do clean underscore, and then whatever I named the field, right? So these are arbitrary names. They do make sense for what it is, but you would say something like email. And it takes in the argument of self, and you can do args and keyword args. 
So to get the actual email, you would do email equals to self.cleaneddata.get email or the name of the actual field, right? So this gives me that value and then I would return what that value is. Okay, so let's take a look. I'll go ahead and print out that email. And this time I'm just gonna add, you know, .edu, okay? We hit send. In my terminal, I see that I printed out two things, right? One's from the view, one's from the form itself. So it actually printed out that email just fine. So I can prevent certain kinds of emails from coming in here. And this is true for any field, right? You could, you could run a simple method to check whether or not this is a valid email. So I can do a condition and I'll just say if email dot ends with dot edu. So if the email string ends with dot edu, then we'll raise a forms dot validation error and say this is not a valid email. Please don't use dot edu, something like that. Okay, so I refresh, I resubmit it, same exact one with that email. This is not a valid email. Please don't use edu. Cool. So that's a way to do validation right in our form. Now, naturally, I can also do this same thing in our model, All right? So let's go ahead and do title. So this time I'm gonna say clean title. Title is one of my fields. This time it's actually coming from the model itself, not the form itself. So again, I have to change everything from email to title. And something that I can do is actually run a query set on this. So I can say QS equals to blog post dot objects dot filter. And we would say title equals to title, All right? So this is looking to see if there's any values of that. And then I would do something like QS dot exists this the validation error being this title has already been used. Please try again. Okay, so now I have a way to actually clean out what that title is. And let's go ahead and make a new one with a title that I know exists. So blog dash new, I called it Tesla. One of them was, and I say ABC, and then I hit some content. And what do you know? That's a very practical example of a title that we don't want to reuse without putting that unique clause in here, right? So the form will also make sure that we aren't using that unique clause. So let's go ahead and grab one of our slugs. Doesn't really matter which one and hit send. That will also show up. So that's pretty cool. Now, what I actually showed you was another way to prevent the same exact value from being used again. And to really make this query set call better, we use the case insensitive I contains or I exact. So I exact means that if I used a lowercase t for Tesla and hit send, it would still say the same thing. Now, if I didn't do that and I ran it, it doesn't say that thing, right? I still have a validation error with the slug, but I have to capitalize the T in order for that to work. And that's why we use I exact here. And that way, it doesn't matter how things are capitalized in here, it's still going to be actually going off of that. Pretty cool. So naturally, there are two things that we want to have happen when we create data. One of the things is we want to prevent who can actually do it. Like right now, anyone who has access to that URL could actually make a new blog post. So the first thing that I want to do for that is cr use the login required decorator. So we'll do from Django dot contrib dot auth dot decorators. We're going to import the login required decorator. Now with this, I can just go ahead and say at login required. And this is a wrapper that goes around this view and checks whether or not this user has a session and they are a valid session, so they're actually logged in. So we come into our uh, blog new. In my case, it works because I'm still logged in to the admin site, right? If I go into an incognito window, as in I'm not logged in, it does not work. It actually prompts me to log in. Now I can change where I log in, right? So I can come in here and say login 
URL equals to slash login. And try that again. And I get an error. Let's restart the server. Refresh. Um, and we'll go to blog new. And there we go. So it actually changes that URL. Now I can also change this in my settings really simply by going into settings and saying login URL and changing wherever that is. And then in my view, I don't have to do that argument anymore. So we take a look, copy that, paste it in, and sure enough, it changes where it needs to go. Okay, well, that's cool. Um, there is another decorator that we will talk about, and that has to do with whether or not the user that's trying to access this is staff. The other one is called staff member required. And you can actually use two decorators together if you want. Um, in my case, I'm just gonna have one. Okay, so I'll go ahead and import the staff member required decorator. It's from a slightly different place and it's from django.contrib.admin this time. Dot views, dot decorators, import staff member required. Okay, and now that we've got that, we look in to our admin, to any specific user. Let's rerun the server. And we see that there's this permissions aspect where we can do staff status. And that just means that they have to have staff status to actually get to that page. And if we go to blog new, it automatically forces you to log in to the Django admin, which is pretty cool. So we now have two ways to protect any view. We can do it for any logged in user or a user that has permission to do these things. Now, if you have like a bunch of blog writers on your staff, then yeah, staff member required might work. You could go into doing more additional customization, um, but at this point, these are both really good for what we need now. So one other thing that we need to talk about is actually associating any given blog post to a specific user. So the other thing that we do when we wanna create data is actually a, associate that data to a specific user. And we do this by declaring what's called a foreign key into our blog post. What a foreign key means is that we can tie in one model to another. It joins these models together so we can do all sorts of really cool things. We'll see what that means in just a moment. Now. What do I want to actually associate this blog post to? Well, I want to actually associate it to a user, as in the user that's actually adding this blog post. So do models.foreign key, and we need to actually get the model that's related to this user. In other words, we need to get the user model here, right? So to get the user model, we have to do it in this way. We do from django.conf import settings, and we say the user model is equal to settings.auth user model. Now for users, this is literally the only way you do it, right? Because if you change the, the default Django user model, this would still work versus actually trying to import the model class itself. If you don't know what I mean, it's okay. Just remember whenever you need to use user, do this. Okay, so we'll go ahead and say user and I'm gonna get, go ahead and add a default in this case. And I'll say the default is my first user, which in my case is my super user, right? And that goes back to like the null blank stuff when we actually change the database. But now that I've made some changes to this model, I'm gonna go ahead and run. Ooh, we get an error. And it's saying it's missing a positional argument on delete. Now this is a new thing for Django 2.0. So older versions of Django inferred, it did something like this. So models.cascade. So what that means is if I delete this user, like the actual user from the database, it would delete everything related to it, including this blog post, right? But what I wanna do is set null. I wanna make sure that if I delete this user, everything that's related to that user is gonna be set null, and you'll see what that is in a second. So I'll say null equals to true there. And now we're gonna go ahead and run our migrations. So python manage.py make migrations and then python manage.py migrate. Okay, 
So we run that server again. And let's go ahead and look in the admin. Okay. So um, let's go ahead and create a new user. And I'll just call it author. Like as in, this is a blog post author. I'll give them staff status. I gave them a whatever password. And I'm going to go ahead and add them to a new blog post. Okay. Grab that author. All right. So they're associated to this blog post now. Um, another title. Another title slug or something. And then content. We hit save and continue. Sure enough, we've made that. Now I'm going to go ahead and delete that user. That user is now deleted. So this object in our database is going to be deleted. And then now when we go to our blog posts and we go to that recent one, it actually goes back to the default user. All right. So in this case, the reason it went back to the default is because I set a default. Otherwise, it would go to null. It would be completely empty. Um, so that's pretty cool. That's if you had someone on your staff that did a bunch of stuff and then you needed to remove them from Django, this would be a way to do that. And in our case, we actually set a default value. So then that user stuff would go back. Now there is one other thing that I want to show you about this, and that is by jumping into the shell. So we do python manage.py shell. And this time I'm going to do a different kind of import for the user model. And that's from Django.contrib.auth. We're going to import the function called get user model. And we'll say user equals to get user model. And use those parentheses to actually get that. So this is the actual user class. Right? So we don't want to import the user class from here ever. You want to import it. If you're using it on models.py for a foreign key, you do it like this. If you're using it anywhere else, you do it like this. So the reason for this is I can say, let's say j equals to user.objects.first. Right? I only have one user at this point. I deleted that other one. Right? So I now have this user j. How do I actually get all of Jay's blog posts? Well, Jay has, or that user has a foreign key to blog posts. So I can actually do a reverse lookup that does J dot blog post underscore set dot all. I'll explain that in a second. But well, we hit enter and that gives me the query set that's related to this user. Notice I did not import the blog post itself right, that blog post class, all I did was grab it from that user's instance. And this is what foreign keys do. They actually associate this data in a way that we can do these kind of dynamic lookups. Now, the reason I knew is blog post dot set or blog post underscore set rather is because the actual foreign key is on this model. So all you need to do is lowercase the name of the model in this case it was blog post and then you use underscore set and that will actually give you the query set that's related to this user. I realize this might feel pretty uncomfortable, um, but just remember that whenever you need to get the reverse of this data, you can do it this way. I will show you one last way to actually get that data and that's actually importing that model itself. So from blog.models import the blog post and then the same exact query set will be blog post that objects that filter user equals to that user instance right here. Or you could do something like user underscore underscore ID equals to J dot ID. Both of those lookups would work. And then we look at that query set. It's the exact same. So those, those are literally the same ways on how to do it. Um, but of course, this one gives me like a lot less work to make this happen. We're going to revisit this again, but I just want to make sure you knew that that is one of the powerful things of using a foreign key instead of like, instead of saying that our author is, you know, some sort of author and we put it in as a char field or a character field, which is fine if you need to do it that way, but actually associating it to the user does have one more benefit. Now, of course, there is still one of the benefit that we didn't talk about. All we showed you was how to create a blog post in the admin. 
And I would imagine you could do it in the shell too. I think you have enough skill at this point to be able to do it in the, in the shell, but I'll give you a little hint. It's blog post objects dot create, and then you add the fields that you need. I'm gonna go ahead and exit out of that old shell and I'll run the server again. The other benefit to using a foreign key versus like a field to actually associate the user is to use it in our view. So we added these decorators here for a reason. That reason is that we know now that request.user will actually return something, right? Because of either one of these decorators. If they weren't in here, we'll actually take a look at that too. So with that, that means that I can come in here and say object.user equals to request.user. It's just really that simple. So now when I go to create a blog post, I can come in here and create another one with some weird slug and hopefully that works and it does. We go into our blog post here in 10 and sure enough, it's associated. Now, maybe you're like, wait a minute, we set that as the default anyway, so how is that possibly correct? Well, let's go ahead and test it out with a new user. So again, I'll bring back that author user. I'll use a whatever password and I'll give them staff status, right? So we'll hit save and continue. We're gonna open up an incognito window now into our project here. And then I'll go ahead and go to blog new. This will prompt me to log in to the Django admin. We go into our author and it brings me back into the actual blog post and I'll say, you know, something like this and whatever. I hit send. We look back into the admin from our other user, this, the main super user. We see that we have a new blog post and sure enough, there is our new author. So this of course is that other benefit is being able to actually set that data when you create data, right? To actually set it to the requested user and now it's associated going forward. Now, if you didn't have these decorators in here, let's say for instance, it was like this, what's actually gonna happen? Well, I'm gonna go back into the incognito window. I'm gonna make sure I'm not logged in. In my case, I'm not logged in, it says anonymous user. And now I'm gonna go into blog new and I'll type some stuff out. Let's make sure I have an actual original post here. I hit send. Then I get this, right? So this is a valid error. And it's saying that it can't assign an anonymous user to the user field in our blog post model. That means that this right here can't be the class of anonymous user, right? So if you're not logged in, you're not the actual user model itself. So to solve this, there's a couple things that you would do. Well, of course you would use those decorators Another would be if not request that user that is authenticated, then we would return some other template, some other data, right? So like, let's say not a user.html. I don't have that. I'm not actually gonna implement that because I don't think this method is good in the long run. But now that I have that, I, I uh, Let's go ahead and refresh this page. Now I get a template does not exist. That's expected because we didn't make the template. Um, but that would be a way that you could solve this problem without using these decorators. But of course, I want to use these decorators. So bring it back. And now, of course, it's going to force me to log in. So I'll go ahead and get rid of this. It's just a method to show you how to handle actually associating a user to form data of some kind. Pretty cool. Now the question is, how do we use this model form to actually perform our updating, right? We have our creation, we have our detail view. Now we need to go ahead and actually update this particular object, whatever that object might be. So to do this, we wanna bring in that form again. So the exact same form. And yet again, I'm going to go ahead and use the form.html. And this time I'm going to go ahead and do a title and say 
update, and then whatever my object is, I'll use the f string substitution with obj.title. All right, I don't need to actually send this object in anymore because I'm using form.html as my template. And then I'm gonna go ahead and pass that form in as context as well. Okay, so now, now that we've got our form in here and we have our title, we're gonna add one more thing into the initializing of the form and that is instance. So we looked up the object here, right? So it's based off of this view. So it's actually updating this object. We can pass into our model form an instance. And what that will allow us to do, let's go back into any given blog post here. So let's take a look. We've got all of our different blog posts. I'm certainly gonna have to link these soon too. Let's go to the hello world one. Okay, so we go to hello world. And then I said, edit. Okay. Um, okay, so a couple things here is I've got a invalid view. Now that's because in my actual view, I didn't pass the slug little thing that I missed when I did that, but that's okay, we're fixing it now. And I refresh in here and we've got all of our stuff. We've got our title, our slug, and so on. If I send this now, title has already been used. Please try again. Hey, wait a minute. This is the one that's using it. So of course that's related to our form validation stuff. That's this right here. Okay. So let's go ahead and comment that out just for a moment. We'll fix it for real and I'll do it again. Save it. Cool. Looks like it's working this time around, right? So we look back in our blog post into that title. Let's just change the content so we can see that the values changed value has changed. We say, say it, send, we refresh in here value has not changed. Well, why is that? Well, of course, we didn't do anything with that data. So we'll say if form dot is valid, then we just do form dot save. We run it again, send it again, you can do it a minute, million times if you want, we refresh and sure enough, it's saved. So I just had that update view work. That's all we had to do. That's it. Just like that. So passing this instance allowed that to happen. But of course, we still saw the problem of this right here, right? So we need to solve this problem. We need to make sure that we can still validate data if we're updating something based off of the same form. Because I bring that back, I might want that in other places. So I certainly need it here. Now, oftentimes when you want to diagnose something like this problem, what I end up doing is printing out the directory of self. So whatever's coming through in self, I wanna see what that is before I do any Googling. So I hit send and I come in here and I have all of these things that are associated to self or that specific instance, right? So what are the things that I'm looking for? Well, what I actually am looking for has to relate to the instance itself. I wanna actually see if this field or this form has any relation to the instance, right? So the self is the actual form. It's the instance of that form, right? So in other words, it's this and this and this. So in any method there, I wanna see what's inside that method and I wanna specifically have the instance. And sure enough, there it is. Right, so you go through them. There's the instance right there. So let's go ahead and say instance equals to self.instance, and we'll just print out what that instance is. Now, before I go any further, I wanna make sure that any other view that's using this form doesn't have any errors with me doing even this. So let's go to our other view. I'm gonna go ahead and leave that open, and we'll go to the blog-new. So I'll create another title with some weird content in it and I'll hit send, I get none. Okay, cool. So the instance is either gonna be none or the actual object itself. Hopefully not a huge surprise there, but that means that this value then I can actually use inside of my query set. 
So I can say if instance is not none, then our query set equals to the query set dot exclude pk equals to instance dot pk. That's the same thing as saying id is equal to instance dot id because those are the same values, but it's cool to see that we can do that. So what this does is it takes our query set that matches this title. It could be a bunch of things. And then it removes the actual instance itself because we don't want to do this same validation on the instance itself, right? So this could be true for title. It could be true for slug. It could be true for content. It doesn't really matter what the query set is. Um, what matters here is that if there is an instance, we don't want that validation error on the instance that we're changing. That's kind of the point. Okay, so now that we've got that, let's go ahead and test it out in both places. So uh, I'm gonna make a new title here and say another new title. Uh, that one might be taken, so I'll just say dash whatever. And then we add that content. That seems to work fine. And then again, I'll do the one where I for sure already have one, which is Tesla. And sure enough, that works fine. So it's now validating just fine on empty data. And now we go back in to our actual post that we're updating. And I keep this as my title and hit send. No longer do I have that error. And I'll just say another value has changed for this data. I hit send and I refresh on the admin, another value has changed. Cool. So that is just a little bit more advanced validation for any given form to ensure that we can do something like this. Now we just need to delete our objects. For some reason, I have this syntax thing going on here. I'm not sure why. I'll just get rid of that comma and replace the order. That seems to solve that syntax error, even though it wasn't a syntax error, whatever. Okay, so now that we've got this, we need to update our delete view. So what I'm actually gonna do in here is just literally say if request.method equals to post, then we'll go ahead and do object.delete. It's really just that simple. And something I missed on the update view, we also wanna have the staff member required on here for both of them, right? So the reason I'm doing this request.method has to do with what I want this delete to look like. So inside of delete.html, I'm gonna go ahead and say, um, leave this title and say, do, are you sure you want to delete? And then have that H1 in there. Perhaps we bring this down to the paragraph. Are you sure you wanna delete this or the following? Then we just put in a form with the method of post and we don't need to put the action, close off that form. We put the CSRF token in here. The form is actually empty otherwise. So we just do button. I'll add a class and we'll say BTN, BTN and danger. And we'll say yes, delete. So it's basically an empty form. Sure, I have that token because I need that. And this basically empty form, what it does is it will actually call this method right here and then we'll delete it. So this is really just a confirm page, right? There's other ways to actually go about deleting these things, but this is nice because then it's saying, hey, are you sure you wanna do this? Yes, I wanna do this, boom, we go and do it. So after that happens, we actually want to redirect them somewhere else because this view is no longer gonna be valid, right? But well, we'll do that in a second. Let's go ahead and delete one of these. And I'll go into, let's just do hello world and into delete. Now I see, are you sure you want to delete the following? This is my title, yes, delete. Okay, so now I think it might, may have been deleted. Let's go ahead and refresh the page. And sure enough, I get a page not found, right? So that's why I want to redirect here and we'll just return. And if I scroll up, to my shortcuts, I can import something called redirect. And so after this method happens, we return the redirect and we take it home or to my blog posts, either one. Okay, so let's try that again. I've got my blog post in here 
And, oh shoot, I don't actually know how to get to any of these. So I have to, I have to go into my admin, grab the actual slug itself. Alright, then delete, and then yes, delete. And sure enough, that blog post gone, and we look into the admin again, and sure enough, we only have a few, or we have a few less. Cool. So now we have our delete view. Now I did bring up one thing, is we have very, very poor navigation. In fact, we don't really have navigation. So let's go ahead and do that. We now need to update our list view to have links. It's really simple. We go into list.html and we use the a tag, a href, blog, and then object.slug. Because remember, that's our lookup and that's also what we put in our URL. So we put that there and then we close off that a tag. Okay, so that's one way to do it. We click on here and sure enough, it goes to where it needs to go. A more conventional method would be in our actual model is to make something called git absolute URL. And this will just return whatever that path is. So in my case, it was blog and we'll use f string substitution and just do self dot slug. Self dot slug, of course, is referred to that instance itself. And then in our list view, instead of dot slug, we would use git absolute URL for the entire thing, actually. We don't need slug, we put it right here. Cool, so this is certainly a Django convention, so we wanna stick with those conventions. And we could actually use this same concept for our other items, which was, you know, git edit URL. And then this was just slash edit. You could call git update, this is not convention, right? This is, okay. So now that we've got that, um, I can also go into my detail view now and say, if request a user is authenticated, and if, and then if request that user dot is staff, and if, then we will go ahead and say, a href object dot git edit url and just literally edit and heck we might want to also just say delete as well in this case we can do another one for delete and delete of course, you might see some redundant information here. So yes, of course, we would actually come in here and do something a little bit more like self.getAbsoluteURL. Make sure that if there's a slash here, there's not one there. Uh, but in my case, I don't have one. There we go. And this is delete. Okay, so now our detail has the ability to be edit and delete if they're staff. So we look here and edit delete. Great, if I open this up in an incognito window, I don't see those things. Cool, so that adds some navigation to this. Let's go ahead and add in a nav bar for this. I'm gonna go into getbootstrap.com, into documentation, into components, down to nav bar. And we're going to go ahead and use their default here. I'll just copy it. And I'm going to go into my templates, I'll make a new file in here and call it navbar.html. I'll paste all that code in. And now what we can do is a, another item that you may have not seen yet. And that is include navbar.html. So what this does, this block, allows you to just bring in another HTML document so you can reuse it wherever you need. Now, of course, in the case of a nav bar, that absolutely makes sense. So I refresh in here, and now I've got this nav bar. You know, this also may make sense for, let's say, our optional JavaScript. We make another new template, and we call it js.html. And we paste that stuff in, and we go back into base, and we say include js html okay and perhaps you do it with your head document as well 
Um, I'm going to leave it as is, and I'm also going to go ahead and get rid of replace this value. We don't, we certainly don't need that anymore. Okay, so now with my nav bar, I can just make changes as I need. So navbar.html, um, my homepage, which is linked here, and it's also linked here. Instead of having it as a hash, I'll just have it as a slash, and I'll call this my try Django blog. And then home page right here is going to be that. Okay, so I have this active class. I don't want that anymore. Um, I will probably add it back. But here we go. So we've got our home page. I can click on that now. Uh, my home page doesn't make a whole lot of sense right now. Uh, but I also want to have a blog, right? So my blog. And then we'll go into our slash. There we go. So now I can go to the blog, hopefully. Oops. We need to actually put in the link to it. And now I can go to the blog and I can look at any given item. Cool. So these extra things I don't want, right? So this drop down, I'll get rid of this. Disabled, I'll get rid of that. Okay, it's starting to look a lot more like something I would want to see. Now, I have this search feature here. Perhaps I want to allow a search to actually happen. We will look at that. But before I do that, I want to style the way my blog looks as far as the list is concerned. So let's go ahead and try that out. So the nice thing about this include is I can also use it inside of a iteration. So I could say something like include navbar inside of this object list. I'll just go ahead and rerun the server and then check in here. And what you've got, we've got the navbar showing up several times. Now, of course, that's not really that practical. You wouldn't want to have your nav bar show up a lot. Instead, what we'd want to do is have a uniform way to display listed items, right? So in other words, I want to have this be like this include so that if I want it on my blog post page or I want it on my home page, I want them to look the same. I want a reusable template that I can use inside of other templates. So to do this, we're going to go into our blog templates and we're going to go ahead and say list inline.html. Okay, so now this include instead of being navbar, it's going to be blog slash list inline.html. And inside of that, I'm going to go ahead and cut out this list element here and paste this in. We save that, I refresh there, and sure enough, it actually renders out all of this content. So the nice thing here is that I'm seeing that this object is being passed into this include by default. But I can be more explicit than that by saying with something like maybe blog post equals to object. Right, so now I'm taking one of the template variables and I'm passing it in as another template variable. And then inside of that include, we can go ahead and do something like that. Let's go ahead and restart the server and we refresh and sure enough, everything's still working. Now you certainly have to include that width. If you don't include width, it's gonna give you something like this, right? Okay, so we need to have width in there to have our own custom variable. So these are completely custom. I could call it post, I could call it whatever I'd like. And if you wanna stick with object, you can also stick with object uh, but I'm going to go ahead and keep it in as blog post. So that way I know whenever I open up list dash inline, I get something like this. Okay, cool. So what's the real reason for this is to make one place to update any of my inline templates for this blog. So in other words, let's go ahead and make a div class and we're going to call it card and we'll close that off. And then I'll do div class of car dash body. These are, of course are bootstrap classes and you can check the reference for them right here in components slash card. And then I'll go ahead and do H5 class equals to car dash title. And then we will do our card title. In this case, it's blog post dot title. And then um, I'll go ahead and do P class equals to car dash text. And I'll actually put the content. So I'll do blog post dot content here. Close off that P tag. And that's where I'll leave it. Okay, so I'll get rid of this list element now, save that card. 
and now let's refresh in here and what do you know so i have at least a little bit better of a display or at least something i could probably reuse now inside of my list element i could also do a div class of card group something like that and that's going to change how those items are rendered and naturally this looks funny and the reason why of course is how our base.html has been running We've been putting the block content inside of all this. So what I'm gonna do instead is just put it inside of a container and we'll actually use container-fluid. Okay, so this should absolutely change how this is rendered out and sure enough it is. So this is probably closer to what you might want in a blog. Maybe not because of even when I, you know, mash it down, it's not looking that great. So then it comes back to going back into the list and just saying, um, maybe like row and then in the list inline, we do something like div class equals to column, column, you know, let's say medium six and MX auto. And maybe the default would be like column 12. Okay, cool. We refresh and there you go. So you've got a little bit of a different look, right? Um, that's pretty cool. It's allowing us to see multiple things as far as the column is concerned. You know, perhaps you change it to 10 and then it's more centered and then perhaps you add some margin to the bottom. All right, so you can play around a lot with these things um, as far as how this is rendered and displayed. But that's actually not why I showed you this, not so much of the design, but also to show you this right here. And then if we wanted to reuse this somewhere, Let's say, for instance, on our home page, we could do that. So let's go ahead and do from, and this is going to be blog.models, import blog post. And now what I'm going to do is instead of my list context as it is, I'm going to go ahead and say QS equals to blog post dot objects dot all. And I'll only go up to like maybe five of them. Okay. So now my context, I'll go ahead and do my blog list. This time it's not object list, instead it's just blog list. And it's that query set there. I'll get rid of this condition, we don't need that anymore. And then my title, I'll go ahead and say, welcome to try Django, okay? And then I jump into home.html where I had all this stuff rendered out. I'll go ahead and do h1 for my title. And then now the iteration for my list was blog list, I believe. What do we call it? Blog list. So for a in blog list, now we would just say include blog list dash inline with blog post equaling to a and closing off all that. There we go. And now we go to our homepage. Oh, blog list inline dot HTML. Template does not exist. I forgot the HTML. Perhaps you saw it and we refresh and now I've got that same stuff coming in, but now it's only five posts versus all of the posts. Um, so this makes it also very easy for me to adjust exactly how I want my inline list element to be rendered. Now you might also be like, well, why don't I use this on my detail as well? That's not a terrible idea. But we're not going to do that at this point because I need to learn a few more things about how I would use this include template. Jumping over to lipsum.com, I'm just going to make some arbitrary text paragraphs. I'm going to go ahead and say 25 and we're going to generate it. And I'm just going to go ahead and copy all of these paragraphs. Lorem Ipsum just makes it look like real text, even though it's all just gibberish. So I copy that and in one of my blog posts, let's go into the like smallest number blog post or the smallest ID number that is. And we'll go ahead and save that data, All right? So if we look into one of our posts, we now see, whoa, we've got a bunch of data in here. So there's a couple things that we need to fix with our template. One of them is saying line breaks. So if I do line breaks, it will actually reformat it to how it should, right? With the actual paragraph tags and all that. Um, but of course, on my homepage, I, I might not want to show this entire post. I mean, maybe you do, maybe you don't. Uh, maybe only on the blog I show that entire post. So the possibility here is to jump 
into our list in line again. And we can actually use that arrow or that line, the pipe is what it's called. And we can use something called truncate words and we can truncate it to a certain number of words. Let's say 30, right? So now when I refresh, sure enough, it goes down to 30. This is just 30 words and then it adds this little dot, dot, dot there, right? And if we come over here, same deal, okay? So yeah, of course, this is one of those reasons as to why you would use those list inlines. So since I have this now, I also wanna add one more thing to this body and that's a href. And of course, I wanna be able to actually go to the blog post itself. So blog post.git absolute URL. And we'll just go ahead and say view. Here we go. So now I have a way to actually go and view that blog post. Cool. So I do wanna make this list in line a little bit more dynamic though. Like maybe I don't always wanna truncate these words. Maybe I do, maybe I don't. I'm gonna say that I don't. I probably don't always wanna truncate words. So to compensate for this, what we can do is we can pass in another argument. And in this case, I'm just gonna call it truncate and I'll say true. So on that main list page, as well as the home page, I'll go ahead and say truncate being true. So that means then in my list inline, I can create a variable that will do this for me or use off of that variable rather. So we would say if truncate, Otherwise, we will just show it out. We'll use the line break still, come in here, just like that. Cool. So what we expect to see is the home page being truncated still, sure enough it is, and the blog page also. Great. So the next thing is perhaps I wanna add in detail being false. Okay, yet another element here of detail being false. And we'll say if not detail, then we'll show the view. Okay, now why did I do this? Well, the truncate one I think is fairly obvious. The detail one is because now I can actually use the same include for my detail here, right? The blog post is still that object like we've seen. Truncate now is gonna be false or I could just leave it out and detail is going to be true. And sure enough, we refresh on our list, that's fine. We go to view it and yes, now we have actual consistent looking pages. Right, so my, the reason my detail looks a little bit different than my list is because I didn't put everything inside of a row. So let's make sure we do put everything inside of a row here. And sure enough, now it's gonna be a lot closer, but of course we have these items over here that we haven't really accounted for just yet. So I'll just put those into a div class of column 12. And I'm actually gonna only do that if they come through save that and there we go so now the design is very consistent whether i'm viewing it or not and also we have that truncated value and then that view button goes away if we're on that actual detail itself it does have edit and delete because we made it do so pretty cool right this include is a nice feature but of course not something that is required it's really just think starting to think about how you want to make it a lot easier for consistent feel across your entire site. Now, a blog post isn't really complete unless we have a publish date, All right? So I'm gonna use models and we'll do date time field. So the date time field can be either the date field or the date time field. It depends on whether or not you wanna use the time of day. Then we can go ahead and say auto now equals to false and auto now add equals to false. And then I'll leave it like that. I'm gonna go ahead and use a couple other ones as well. And one of them is gonna be timestamp and one of them is gonna be updated. Okay, so 
the timestamp one will be auto now add being true. The updated one being auto now being true. This is to illustrate what those two values do. And then our date time field, well, I might wanna allow it to be null and blank, right? The reason being is like, perhaps I haven't set a publish date yet. So if I haven't, then this can be an empty field. All right, so I've added three fields to my models. What do I need to do? Python manage.py, make migrations, and then right off the bat, it's saying you're trying to add timestamp with auto nail equaling to true. Of course, the database needs to know about that and we need to provide a one-off value. I can use timezone.now. That is fantastic. So that means that I can set that default value. Now updated is going to set a very similar value. I just don't need to declare it. Only the timestamp, right? So this is basically saying that all of my old posts have the exact same timestamp now. So I'm gonna go ahead and run python manage.py, migrate, and let's go ahead into our admin. Let's make sure the server is running. So python manage.py, run server. And we see that we now have a publish date, but those two other fields I do not have, right? I don't see timestamp or update it. So let's go ahead and just save this one. So this ID of three should have a different updated than perhaps all of the other ones. So let's go into our shell and take a look. Python manage.py shell, and I'll go ahead and do from blog post, or rather from blog.models import blog post. And we'll do QS blog post.objects.all. And the first one, so QS.first.updated, there's my updated date time object. I can also look at the timestamp itself. Not a whole lot different, but still a value. And I can't actually change these, right? They change automatically. So what auto now add does is says, when you create this into the database, when you add it into the database, this field gets actually changed to that time. When you update it, whenever you hit save, this will change. And then of course the publish date is something that I would change, not necessarily anyone else, right? Pretty cool. So now that I've got this, I can actually look at another one. So qs.last.updated, and we'll see that the qs.last updated is the exact same as the timestamp for the other one. So basically it set it the when we actually added it to the database, right? So when we actually added it to our migrations, that's when that set it. Uh, there's also another error, which is these right here. I need to actually put some parentheses there to actually run that. Um, little small thing there. Uh, but now we have a publish date and timestamp. It probably makes a lot more sense to order things by these dates. So I'm gonna go ahead and do class meta and say ordering equals to, well, if I want the most recent one first, I would do negative publish date. If I want the oldest one first, as in it was posted a long time ago, you would leave that out. So I'm gonna do publish date then I'm gonna do updated, and then I'm gonna do timestamp. So this ordering has to do with the query set, right? So the order of this query set. And before I change anything, it has to also do with the posts themselves. So let's go ahead and take a look at what the changes do. We made changes to our models, so we run python manage.py, and then python manage.py migrate. And let's go ahead and run the server and take a look at that ordering change. So if we look at our blog post now, we see that the third object is now first when it used to be at the bottom, right? So um, I'm just gonna give that example. It used to be, where is the primary key or ID? Those are the same. We would refresh in here. Um, oops, not in that order, but rather the newest one first. So negative, negative PK. This is what it was by default, right? And by adding these other ones, it allowed this to come out in a different way. And that also means that my list view should also be different. It should also be based off of the updated and blog posts, right? So let's go ahead and update this one. I'm just gonna hit save and continue. So as of now, 
I'm going to refresh. And what do you know? That recently saved one is now at the very top. But of course, this is a problem because none of them have been quote unquote published. So we're going to go ahead and do that. So now that we have the publish date in here, we see that I have a lot of objects or a lot of posts that haven't actually been published. They don't have a date that was actually set for that publishing. So I need to use something that will eliminate those from even being displayed. And there's a few different ways on how you could go about doing this. Number one, in your views, you could modify this to be something like this. Let's go ahead and do from Django.utils. We're going to import the time zone. And then we'll just say now equals to time zone dot now. So if I wanted to only show the ones that were published, I would say QS equals to blog post dot objects dot filter publish date underscore underscore is greater than or equal to now, or rather it would be less than or equal to now. So it happened in the past, right? So this would be a way to filter these things down. I comment this out and I go to my blog nothing's there. No surprise, we haven't actually published anything. We never said that we did. So this is okay, but the problem here is that it's in the actual view. So you'll have to remember to always run these things. So what we can do instead is use what's called a Django model manager. So I'm going to go ahead and get rid of all these imports and all that stuff and jump back into my models and I'll import the time zone here. So from Django.utils, import time zone and we'll go ahead and create a model manager. So we'll do blog post manager and this is models.manager and then we'll just do define published. This is arbitrary here. So published takes in self and we're just going to return self.get query set. This part's not arbitrary and then filter. Well, that same thing. So we say now equals to time zone dot now. And then we're going to filter our publish date less than or equal to now. So this is this get query set thing. What that's doing is blog post dot objects. That's it. It's doing the same thing, but it allows me to run dot all if I wanted to and as well as dot filter. Cool. So we'll get rid of that. And now to actually map this in, we just say objects is equal to that one initialize it. So the fact that we're using models.manager means that I can still do everything that I've been doing, such as objects at all, uh, such as the creates method when we had that somewhere around here. Um, so we don't want to have our manager be any different than models.manager. So we save that. And now in our list view, we'll just go ahead and say published. Save that, refresh, and didn't come through. Let's go ahead and rerun the server. And now that blog is also still empty, right? So it's going off of published. But I actually want to go even one step further. And that is I want to be able to use this right here on any of my query sets. So in other words, going back into my views, if I did all dot published, it's going to give me an error. The query set has no attribute published. So this is called a custom query set. And it's really simple to make as well. We do class blog post query set. And it's models dot query set. Make sure you capitalize the Q and S. And then this time I'm going to use this exact same thing. I'll cut it out paste it here. But instead of now self dot get query set, it's literally just self dot filter. And then our model manager has to reference that. So we'll define get query set. Hey, what do you know? Then we return our new query set of self dot model using self dot underscore DB. This means that it'll go off of our model. And this is our new query set now. So now back in my views, I can safely use dot published and refresh in there. And sure enough, it does that. If I get rid of dot published, it comes back to what it was. 
So naturally, I still do want to have that method of dot published, and it's define published self, and this time it's return self dot get query set dot published. All right. So this method now calls this one. That way, back in my view, I can do dot all dot published or simply just dot published. Either way works now, but the dot published is very important so that if I have a search feature, I can only get the published items as well. So that's managers and query sets. These are things that can get a lot more complicated than that. Uh, but the nice thing is that we can see at least some of the basics of how it works now. All right, so we have this published date. If we go into our forms and we actually add it into one of our forms, like our model form, and we go to actually edit one of our objects here. Let's just grab one of the slugs, go in there and hit edit. Uh, we should actually see that field. So let's save this and refresh, and there we go. Got a publish date now. If I hit send and refresh this page, it automatically gives me the time. So if you, if you just put in a date here, it will run off of that date. And then if I go into my blog, it shows that again. That's pretty cool, right? So it's back into actually showing it and it works off of just a very simple field. Now there are other customizations that you can do to make this being a dropdown and stuff like that. That takes more JavaScript stuff than what we're gonna cover. So just keep in mind that if you pass in the year, the month and the date, then it will run uh, it might actually be different depending on what time zone you're in, but yeah, year, month, date, that should work just fine. And then, I mean, cause if you try to do, let's say like something like that, it'll say enter a valid date and time, right? So it's year, month, date, and there you go. So now you actually have a way to create a published post. And now of course you can go into the Django admin and do it in there too, right? So if you were to want to just create them, on the front end like this and then publish them, which would be really nice if you had a, an author, like you hired somebody that's their, the author and they write a bunch of posts and then you could go through and actually publish them. That would be a, certainly a good way to do that. Now, something that I do want to address is when we have this blog list view, what if I am logged in and I want to see all of my posts, whether they're published or not. Well, this of course could be a couple things. It could be something as simple as if request that user that is authenticated, we could then do QS blog post that objects that filter user equals to request that user. And then that way that user on that blog post list would see all of their posts whether or not they were published. That's one way to do it. Another way to do it is to, well, to keep this like that, but then combine the query sets together. So I'll just call this my QS and say the final query sets are equal to the first one, pipe my QS and then dot distinct. What this does is it combines query sets of the same class, right? So they're both blog posts. And then it actually uses only the ones that are in there. So it's like the distinct examples of them. It doesn't have duplicates at all. That's why we call the distinct, like the same post is not gonna be posted twice. So if I refresh that, sure enough, it shows me that. Um, and then obviously if I were to get rid of this block or to even go into an incognito window, oops, let's try that again, into an incognito window we would only see that one post, right? Cause I'm not actually logged in. So then of course, if there isn't a post, maybe in our list inline, if it's not the detail, we could then say, um, if not blog post dot publish date, then we can say draft, right? We see that and now we see that it's a draft and we can change these things accordingly. I could also say something very simple and put it into my card here and do like BG, dark and text light. Those are obviously bootstrap classes. 
And there we go. So now you have something like that where it's like, oh, clearly these are drafts. And then naturally we can add in some more text here and you know maybe like a small text and we'll do class equals to text muted and then just do our publish date so blog post dot publish date and small okay so we refresh that and sure enough there you go cool and this one says none well that's no surprise it's not ready to be published yet so we can leave it in as none and especially now that I have these different background, uh, perhaps it's there. Maybe we do warning instead and just do text dark. That way it's like, whoa, that's clearly a post. Or we just do border and border warning. That way it's like, okay, cool. That's not as overwhelmingly a draft, right? Um, cool. So now that we've got this, we can have our published dates. We can release them. Um, we can do all sorts of like better user interface stuff now that we also understand how to do model managers and custom query sets. Now what I want to do is actually have a way to upload items to my blog post, whether they're images or files. I want to know how to actually do that. Now this adds several steps to making this work. So we're going to do all of them in this one. And the first step is to actually set up our settings.py. Now, the reason we have to set up settings.py has to do with what's on the very bottom, and that is related to static files. So static files are any of your cascading style sheets, JavaScript, or images that you need Django to reference relative to your Django project. So right now, what we've been doing is we have all of our CSS and JavaScript coming from a content delivery network. In other words, we have Bootstrap just linked from some other URL, right? So if you actually want those linked in Django, you have to have a way to handle these things. You have to have a way to handle your images, your JavaScript, and your CSS. So that's just for static files. That's not for your uploads. There's another one for uploads as well. So we're going to go ahead and declare static root and media root, we're also going to have the static files ders, and that's going to be a list. And then finally, we will have media URL. Okay, so static root, this would be a live CDN of some kind, like AWS, S3, or something like that. More than likely, when you go live, you're not going to have Django serving your static files. That's insecure, and it's not a good idea. But we're testing things out, so we can do it. I'm going to go ahead and put my static root outside of the SRC folder, and I'm going to call this static CDN test. Static CDN test. And in here, I'm going to go ahead and make a, another folder and I'll just call it blank because on GitHub we'll have a blank.txt and says blank on purpose. I'm not going to have this these files on GitHub but the folder will be there. So this emulates what a static server would be, a static CDN server. It emulates something like AWS S3. So I actually want to reference this folder. Inside of it, I'm going to make another folder called static. And inside of that, I'll make another folder called media. So those are my static root and media root. So we'll do ospath.join. And this is going to be ospath.durname of the base directory. And then it's going to go into the static CDN test. So this is going to be our local static CDN path. That's what this is right here. Okay, and then we're going to just use that path for each aspect. So static and for static root. Okay, so this is taking the place of as if it was a real CDN like AWS S3. 
and then our media would be in slash media. Okay, so the next thing is we would come in here and also have a local version of our static files. So the local version can be inside of your Django project. This is where you would like make some changes, you add them here, and then they would be later uploaded to static root. So let's go ahead and make that folder. And this is gonna be called static files. And again, I'll just go ahead and say blank.txt. In this case, ospath.join. And this is gonna be now my base directory and the static files folder. Okay, so I'll actually come back to the static file stuff in a little bit, uh, but for now, we have an actual place for my actual media. This is where I would upload files. And I realized that like a lot of these things are a little bit complicated right now because the configuration is just weird. I just added a bunch of folders and I'm not really sure what's going on. So to make at least the media part more clear, let's go into our model and let's create our image field. So we'll go ahead and say image equals to models. And at first I'll just go ahead and call it a file field. And I'll say upload to, and we'll just say images slash. And I'll allow it to be blank and null. Okay, so we made changes in our models. We run python manage.py, make migrations, and then python manage.py, migrate, okay. Now that we've got that, let's go into our admin. Oh, let's make sure our server's running. And then jump into our admin. And now we have a field for files. So I can click on this field and let's just take um, something as a screenshot. Just do a real quick screenshot here and grab that. Got a file, I hit save and continue. And sure enough, it seems to have uploaded. Now, where did it go? Well, if we look in our project, we see that it's inside of the media folder, inside of the image folder, and there it is, right? So upload two was inside of that media root into that image, right? So it went into this directory. Now, of course, I already showed you how you could see what that directory is, but we now see that we can upload things there. Okay, cool. So now how does static files work? Well, in this blank.txt, if I just said, this is blank on purpose, save that, close it. And now if I ran, close out the server, something called python manage.py, collect static. And we say, we, you could say yes, or you could just run it. And now what happens is we have our local static files here, right? So if I had CSS or JavaScript or other images, I could load them from there. And all of those go into that static CDN test. We see static, here's that blank file. It says this is blank on purpose. It also has our admin stuff in here. So this is related to the Django admin, which is pretty cool. Okay, so now we have our static files, we have our media files. Now we actually need a way to display them. Now again, if we're using a live CDN, something like AWS S3, they're most likely already displayed, regardless of if our Django project is in production or not, because our static files are being handled by a completely different server than Django. But while I'm testing locally, in this case, I, and especially how I have it currently set up, I have to actually have a way to display this, this data. And we're gonna do that by jumping into our URLs here, and we're gonna add it into a URL that will pretend to be a static CDN serving project. We'll do from django.conf. We're gonna import the settings here. And we're gonna say if settings.debug. So if it's not in production, this is our, you know, our test mode, then we can go ahead and add to our URL patterns. And we add them by first doing an import so I'm gonna actually keep this import inside of the settings debug call here. And I'll do from django.conf.urls.static. And inside of this here, we'll go ahead and instead of having another list here, we'll just go and do static. And this is settings.static. 
URL and the document root equals to settings dot static root. Okay, so of course those settings are the ones that we set in here, static root, static URL, and then we want to do that same thing for media. So copy this line right here, paste it in, and just say media URL and media root. Okay, so now if I refresh on this page and open this up in a new tab, um, I should actually be able to see that image, assuming that I have my server running. Oops, I didn't fully import the static. Well, import error. Let's run that again. Refresh, and now I can see my image. Okay, so again, if I didn't have that, I would not be able to see my image, although Django will still think that's where the image is coming from. Uh, because of how I set up my media URL. Okay, cool. So now that I've got that, I have a way to actually see my images and upload them. That's not too bad. Now, again, we would want to use something different in deployment when we go live, and all of that is covered in the managing static files of Django itself. Cool. In this one, there's a few things we're gonna do. One is changing the file field to an actual image field. Now, in order for me to do this, I have to install pip env install pillow. So pillow is the Python image library and will allow you to use the image field itself. What this will do is just validate whether or not what I'm uploading is an image. Like it, it does make that much of a difference. So after it installs, I'll go ahead and do python manage.py, make migrations, and then python manage.py, migrate. Great, so now I've got that image field. Let's go ahead and run the server again. And um, this time around, when I go to select a file, it's gonna have to be an image, right? It's not gonna let me do anything but an image. So like if I went into you know, Django, notice that all of these things are kind of blocked out. So I will use that image, but what I really want is my blog new to have that image field in there. Now, the, the initial thing would be to go in my forms and then just literally add in image here. And of course, that would give me something like this. That's OK, but if you try to run it, it's not going to do anything. And that's because in form.html, we have to add in something called ink type. And this one will do multi part slash form data. You'll always use this when you want to have data actually come through with this value, with the data um, in your form. So now that we have that, we're almost ready to actually use this post again or the create method. However, our post blog post create view doesn't have a way to get the files. So it's simple. It's request.files or none. Like not a whole lot different than request post, but since we've declared the ink type with multi-part data, we can now pass in files just like that. All right, so we save that. And let's go into our blog post now. And I'll say Tesla again with image. This of course is still just gonna be one of my screenshots here. And I'll do ABC one, two, three, whatever. Publish date, let's go ahead and use something closer to today. Hit submit, go into our admin to the most recent one. What do you know? There is our image and notice that it actually has some appending string there. That's because when we uploaded this image, we already uploaded it, right? So this new one actually just adds some additional data on there to make it unique. So it's not overriding what's already there. Um, so that's actually how you can upload images on a very basic level. Now, there are certainly ways to upload giant images, but that's not something that I'm going to cover at this time. And really, it's not something you should be doing on a blog post anyway. So, of course, the final thing that I need to do is have those images display inside of my inline. And that's also very easy. We just come in here. I'm going to put it right above my title and I'll say if blog post dot 
image. So if there's actually an image there, then I'll go ahead and do img source. And this is going to be blog post dot image dot URL. The URL part is actually important. And then we do class equals to card img top. Okay, so dot URL is going to render out the URL that we have set up in here, right? And if we were using AWS S3 and specifically using Django storages to handle it, uh, both things are certainly really good options and also really easy to set up. Um, it would actually give us that URL. But in our case, since we're testing locally, it's gonna give us a different one. Notice the image comes in and it gives us that relative URL for that image as well as if we scroll down to the other one, right? And using Bootstrap makes that all responsive, which is pretty cool, right? And naturally, if I were to have yet another image, I could just do like sort of a sliver of things like that, and then blog new, and say working image. That last screenshot, working image and it's working cool and then our date here go into our blog and there you go got our working image and the image is not linked right now so i'm going to go ahead and link it that's probably a better idea to have it actually linked so when they click on the image it goes to the blog post itself Pretty sweet. Now we're gonna go ahead and put a lot of these skills together in the form of an actual search. Now with a search button, you would have some sort of query. So let's say for instance, you wanna type out working image and you would search it and this should go to its own view. Like it'd be its own view that would handle the actual search itself. Now, of course, when I entered this search, a question mark was added here. So let's go ahead and take a look at our nav bar and into the actual search form that's in there. So my input, I have this search. I'm gonna go ahead and give it a name. That name is just gonna be Q. That's often what you'll see with a search bar is the name being Q. So now if I type out working image, it now has an argument in here, Q equaling to working plus image. Now, if I change the action, I'm not sure if it works anymore, but if you change the action to Google, dot com possibly even with search at, added to it refresh in here and say like beach image and hit enter it takes you over to google notice that you can't actually search like that so maybe let's put just q yeah so it, it just pre-fills the data now it doesn't actually perform the search so if you hit enter you would actually perform the search um, so that's you know one of those things about action you can change where it's going to go so in this case, I really do need it because on my local page, I want it to go to that search URL all the time, no matter what page it's on, because the nav bar is gonna be on every page. So I wanna make sure that this goes to that search page. So now when I do it and do working image, um, it now goes to a search view. And of course this page is not found. So let's go ahead and make it. Now in my case, like I said, we're gonna to put together a lot of the things that we've done. I'm gonna go ahead and do Python manage.py start app searches. Now this app, we're gonna go ahead and make a model and we'll call it class search query. Takes in models.model, we'll say user and we'll say, say what the query is and we'll do a timestamp, like when it happened. Now to add in the user, we do from django.conf, we're gonna import the settings. And the user is gonna be models.foreign key, settings.auth user model, blank equals to true, null equals to true. The query, this is gonna be a char field. Let's do max length of 220. And I don't want it to be blank, so I'll just leave it like that and then timestamp models.date time field auto now add equals to true. 
Great, so I have a model. Let's go ahead and make sure my app is in the settings. So in here, we call that searches. Save that. Let's go ahead and run our migration. So Python manage.py, make migrations. Ah, and of course, we've got this on delete issue. We've seen that before. Of course, on delete. And this is models.set null. Something I really like about Django is it does give me a lot of these very verbose errors. Next thing is make migrations and then migrate. Since I made that model, I might as well add it into my admin as well. So we'll do from.models, import the model name, then admin.site.register, and we register that model name. Now, all of this is because of my view, right? I actually want to create a view here, and I'll call this the search view, and it takes in a request, and then naturally it's going to return, render, and takes in the request again. The template name in this case, I'll just call it search slash view.html, and I'll put empty context for now. Since I did that, I'm going to go ahead and put this template in here called templates. Inside of the templates, I'm going to make another new folder called search or rather searches to fit with the app name for both of them. And then inside of searches, we'll call it view.html. This view is going to extend from base.html. And then we're going to go ahead and put our block content in here and in block. And I'll go ahead and do a div class of call a, or of row first. So just adding in some of our bootstrap stuff in here. And we'll do a div class of column 10, or rather column 12, column 8 MX auto. Okay. And then I'll just do P class of lead and say you searched for, and we'll put a query in here and then I need to put in my results. So back into my view, we'll go ahead and say query equals to, well, to get the query, we can use the request.get param, and I can use .get and then the name of the query that I'm using. Now, if we go back into that nav bar, we used a name already, we put it in as Q. So if I called this query, you would put this in as query, okay? But I'm going to keep it in as Q. Again, that's fairly common. And then I'm going to set a default value of none, right? So uh, this right here is looking into the request get dictionary, looking for the key of Q. If it doesn't have one, it's going to set it equal to none. So now I can put this in as my context. Let's go ahead and call it context. Okay. And then the next thing is I'll go ahead and import my model. So from dot models, we're going to import the search query model. And I'm going to start out with user being none. And we'll say if request dot user dot is authenticated, then the user is the request dot user. And now I'll just go ahead and do search query dot objects dot create user equals to user query equals to query or that keyword. Right? And if you wanted to make it less confusing, you can use Q. So this will actually save that query every single time. With my search view, I don't need to make URLs for this app because it's really just one view. I'll bring it into my main uh, project URLs and we'll do from searches.views import search view. And then we'll make an endpoint for search with path search and then our search view there. There we go. Cool. So far, so good, hopefully. Let's go ahead and run this server. And let's try that search. Hey, what do you know? You search for working image. Great. So we actually just did a bunch of things quickly, but a bunch of things you should now be very comfortable with. If all of that was uncomfortable, you might want to go back and watch different sections of this. Uh, but I did it really, really quickly. So we're actually now ready to do a more complex lookup using this search query, as we've seen. Now, the reason I actually created a model is sometimes you might want to monitor what queries are coming through. 
and by whom. This is a way to do that. You can then go into your actual admin and look at those search queries and see what queries or what people are looking for uh, altogether. Right? Now, of course, if I have no query here, I get this error. So um, what I want to do then is actually just say, if query is not none, then we do that. Because we can't have, it says not null constraint, I can't have that query field as null. So really, I only want to show that up if there is an actual query. So we save everything, go back in here, we search for none. So one final step really for this is to say, if query, then we will show that query. Otherwise, we can just bring in that form again. And that's exactly what I'll do. So the form being what's in the nav bar. And in here. And there we go. All right. So now new search. Do that search. And what do you know? Pretty cool. Now for our final feature of this, we're going to have a query that actually looks up stuff in the database. So let's go ahead and jump into our blog model. And I'm going to go ahead and make a model manager called search. And it's going to take in self and query being none. Okay, so if the query is none, we'll just say if query is none, then we'll just return self.getQuerySet.none. It's just a way to return the query set of this type. Otherwise, we're going to return the self.getQuerySet. And well, I want to also have a search method up here because for the same reasons of published, I might want to have the ability to search things. So self and query. And this one I'll go ahead and return initially self.filter and say title I exact that query. Okay, so then we would pass in this query here. And with my search, I also want to make sure that they are only published items. So I'll go ahead and do dot published as well, which we'll call this right here. So then it'll say inside of things that are published, go ahead and do this search. Okay, so now that we've got that, let's go back into our view here. And we'll do from blog dot models import blog post. And now our actual query set or the you know blog list equals to blog post dot objects dot search query equaling to that query. All right? So we have that dot search because I made it a model manager. I also made it a custom query set so we could do it on other things. So I could also do dot all dot search. Okay. So this is our blog list now. What I'm going to do first is actually move my context up a little bit. And then in here, I'll give my context of being blog list equaling to blog list. Not a big deal here, because then in my view, we can tab this in a little bit. And I'll go ahead and say for blog item in blog list in four. And much like we've seen before, we can include our blog stuff. Okay, so blog post in this case is blog item, truncate true, detail false. Okay, so we save that. We do a search for working image. What do you know? It's working. Now, what if I did a search for it's working? Hmm, that's not actually coming in. Now, a way I could fix that is by changing this from title to content and refresh. And it's still not coming through. So let's try I contains. And I contains worked. It actually showed me it's working. So this is a little bit of a problem. And that's where these complex lookups come in. So we use something called a Q lookup. So from Django.models import Q, that's capital Q. So we can actually chain different lookups together. 
So we can say the lookup equals to Q and title underscore underscore I contains that query. Um, or with that pipe there, we can do Q content contains that query. And we put these into some parentheses there. And now I have a more complex lookup that I can pass in to my query or to my filter itself. Now, of course, they can be chained and have more things in here, like you could also include the slug, right? And the reason I'm using I contains is because we just want to check if this query is within this field. So slug. Okay, so now that we've got that, let's refresh again. Again, it's working. And now if I do a search for working image, again, it's working. Now I could also go one step further and say that I want to look up maybe my user, like the author, right? So let's go ahead and say user and first name, I contains query. Or, and notice that they are double underscores here, or we could do last name. Or you could do the username or email or, 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 right? So this gives me a nice complex lookup for this item here. And now if I search, let's say CFE, it searched for CFE. I did email, let's, let's change it back to username or change it to username. And there, now I can actually get all of the published items from this user. And this is also even more clear when I do this search and I'm not logged in, right? And it does it in the same order. Everything's in the same order as the published date themselves, right? And it's using all of the things that we've come together. But now we have a much more complex lookup and a way to actually do a robust search for our project. Now, this is also where you can start thinking about how to do different kinds of views. Now that I can do this more complex search, that's really just a more complex way of doing these things. You don't always have to do it in the, in the sense of like, it's a search view and it's actually running some search. All right, so that's it. We have now created a very functional blog. I realize there's some things that are missing and we'll talk about that uh, in the next one, uh, but just keep in mind that all of the stuff that we've learned here can be built on top of, and this is where you would then start taking a lot more stuff related to Django. But I will leave you with a challenge before we talk about what's next. And that challenge would be to actually do everything we did, but for comments, like making comments on any given post. I think that you can do that now because you've learned a lot about how to associate user data, making forms and all that. So that's where I leave you. Thanks so much for watching Try Django 2.2. I realize we went through a lot in this series and I do encourage you to break things. Like the only way you're really gonna learn is by number one, coding and doing the things that hopefully you did that whole time. And then num number two is actually breaking things, like trying new things and then getting into a state where it feels like it's unsolvable. That is where you're gonna have a lot of growth. And then finally, one of the main reasons I focused on this being a blog is so you can actually start sharing the things you learn. We need more people teaching Django. That way we can all understand it on a much deeper level. I think that's really important as well. So anyways, thanks so much for watching and I'll see you next time.